Hello and welcome back to uh, Blizzard Watch uh, Playtest Daggerheart. Uh, this is, uh, I would say up front, this is based on the playtest rules. Uh, so anything you hear, we A might get wrong or B might change before the final game comes out. And with that out of the way, uh, my name is Phil Ulrich. I'll be your DM for the day. And I need to know, do all my players have their pairs of D12s? Uh, yes. Go ahead and introduce yourselves and tell us a little bit about your character. Just a little one-liner about who you're playing today. Do you want to go alphabetical? Yeah, why not? Then that means me first. Hi, I'm Ann Stickney. I'm playing Thistledown Cad Wall. She's a fairy in a, a group of traveling archaeologists and entertainers. All right, uh, Liz. Oh, Odie. Wow, that didn't come out right. Hello, this is uh, Liz Harper. You may know me from most of our other podcasts. And I am playing Arvid Olson, who is uh, a tiny frog. Very friendly, merchanty type. Definitely completely friendly and normal. Definitely very forthright, upright, and honest. Yeah. Come on. Obviously. Uh, and Matt Rossi. I am the orphan. I was made long ago. I am here to help you. Okay. And uh, Nick. I don't know how I'm going to follow that, but. <laughs> yeah, <I'm> right? <laughs> <laughs> I am Nick Marino. I am mainly one of the writers and. Today, I will be playing Ao, the Orderborn Elf Guardian, and potentially a side character in Thistle's adventure. Thank you for reminding me how to say your character's name. Uh, we also, if you listen to the Session Zero, we were hoping to have Joe Perez with us today too, but he is not feeling well. So uh, rest up, Joe. Uh, the rest of us, however, are going to take a swing at the uh, the the quick start playtest game for uh, Daggerheart. So if this sounds interesting to you, uh, you can check out, I think it's uh, daggerheart.org. Download all the playtest materials, including like 300, a 300-page 300 manuscript of the book, but also a quick start, uh, which will include the adventure we uh, will be running through today. Uh, although, of course, we'll be making some changes to it, because of course we will, because that one comes with uh, pre-generated characters. You don't even have to go through a session zero like we did. You could just jump right in. Quick correction, it's daggerheart.com. Oh, thank you. Uh, daggerheart.com. It's, that one's easy to mix up. I wonder what's .org. What did I send people to? Oh, <laughs> daggerheart.org is a place a placeholder that's also about it, but probably not my daring to press. Yeah, dagger. It's like a fan site, I think. So yeah. close, but not quite. They'll get there in the right in the right direction. So uh, okay, so let's see. I guess we can kind of just jump right into it here. Um, and we'll cover rules when they come, you know, when they come up, because nobody really wants to listen to a bunch of rules up front. That's how you bore everybody at game night. Um, but we'll talk a little bit about where you guys are as we jump into the action here and what you're doing. Um, so <laughs> I had, a, I had a, a little more storming session with uh, Anne at the uh, beginning of the week because this, uh, as it's written, kind of assumes that you're using the pre-generated characters and we are not. So... Um, I'm just going to let Anne talk a little bit. Anne, you want to talk about the circle bound? Yeah, so the circle bound... I'm trying to remember the full name. Hang on. I will the, have circle, the circle bound cortege de R. Yes. Um, so the circle bound... Is, the circle bound cortege de R is the group that uh, Thistledown is traveling with. But they are just one spoke of the circle bound. The circle bound is like a group of about 12 different traveling archaeology troops that uh, once a year they come together into this big market and sell all the stuff that they find and also reunite owners with with things that they might have lost over the course of time or whatever um so it's it's more about reuniting people than it is selling things but occasionally they find stuff where it's like oh well this has no importance like historical importance to anybody so we're just going to go ahead and sell it at the market um if you ever read stardust or seen stardust it's sort of like the market <laughs> at a wall right except that it's very history focused so each of these spokes goes out in a different direction after they meet um and 
sees what they can find, looks up leads, finds the artifacts, and in between, they make money. And the way that they make money is through entertainment. It's not like performers. It's basically imagine a really weird roadside museum. It's a traveling weird <laughs> roadside museum. That's what this is. And they will show off the artifacts that they found, but they also have a collection of weird stuff like, you know, strange bodies and jars with formaldehyde and things like that. Or like skeletons that are made up of creatures that don't actually exist, you know, that kind of a thing. Um, and that's kind of how they make their money. Uh, Thistledown is, she's not really like high ranking in the group. She's a fairy. She's very small, but she tends to the animals. That's like her thing that she does. So all the pack animals that carry things around and whatnot, she's the one that kind of takes care of them and makes sure that they're fed and this, that, the other. For whatever reason, she's really good with animals. Um, the leader of the Circle Bound, not sure who that is, but Phil probably knows. <laughs> Oh, I was going to ask you if they had a name. <laughs> uh, probably at this point. So it was Jorad for a while. Um, not Jorad. Uh, <laughs> Jared, the the bard that Thistledown was super friends with. Um, but he passed away. And when he passed away, the person that took it over was a lady who was, um, what's the equivalent of a tiefling? Is there equivalent of a tiefling? Uh, daemon. Daemon. Okay, so she's a daemon, but like, She's good. She's not. She's just like very down to business and everything. And her name is Therasia. Is that all you need? That is perfect. So I um, could keep going. Yeah. They pay me to make up stuff on the spot. So <laughs> I know it was uh, it was very fun to jam. Uh, so no, that's perfect. Actually, that's exactly what I needed. Um, we discussed that the uh, the the this yearly gathering at this place, the Crossbar Compass Court, is. Uh, both private gathering, uh, it's it's invite only, and also we discussed that this is how the circle bound key from just being the British Empire crossed with the circle, you know, crossed with a roadside museum, um, as they give your stuff back. Um, but a lot of the people who are invited are people who are going to be receiving artifacts or uh, buried treasure or whatever from the uh, from the circle bound. Uh, but you know, some some number of the people who are invited are just uh, you know friends or companions or whatever people who've done the circle of favor, personal invites. It's like, hey, I've got friends and family invites to the the gathering at the crossbar. It's like a friends and family alpha, but exactly. it's also if they happen to find a lead on somebody who's looking for some piece that isn't of historical significance, but something they want to sell, then like they will get an invite. With a, with a the caveat of hey we've got something you might be interested in you should come exactly so one way or another each of you has been invited along uh, kind of the the chain of people who know Thistledown to the crossbar and Theresia had a favor to ask of Thistle and this is where we find you all on kind of an odd favor the crossbar is uh, adjacent to this region called the Sablewood the Sablewood is a uh, kind of your your stereotypical deep dark forest, I guess. These trees are absolutely colossal, and this place is renowned for two things. Uh, one, um, these pathways that run through it, they're trade routes uh, for merchants to get to places on each side of the Sablewood. Um, the, keeping the roots open is extremely important because this, this forest has been here older than the Forgotten Gods, um, and there's only one settlement inside it. The other one is the hybrid animals that live inside the, uh, the sable wood. And even now, as you all are traveling in your carriage, you can hear strange sounds like the calls of the lark moths or the croak of lemur toads in the trees. Uh, who, I'm, I think I know the answer to this, who is driving this yak drawn carriage? Oh, that would probably be me, I'm assuming. I'm having a lot of fun picturing a little tiny fairy driving this yak drawn carriage. Yeah, <laughs> it's not so much driving as she's like perched on the head of the lead yak, because there's like three of them yoked. There's like one in front, two behind, right? And she's perched on the head yes. of the front one and just encouraging it. Perfect. So the favor that you all were asked is you were given a, uh, a package by Theresia. It's a crate. Uh, it was already packed when you got it and loaded on the carriage. And uh, you were asked to bring this to the only settlement inside the uh, inside the Sablewood, uh, which is a, a little village. Oh, it's not a little village. A farming village known as Hush. Uh, and there is a uh, kind of a renowned uh, magician there, the White Fire Arcanist. And it was... Framed to you as crucial for the crossbar uh, that you all take this crate 
uh, to the White Fire Arcanist, and whatever instructions she gives you so there, she gives you there to follow them. Uh, and that's all the details you got. This is on kind of a need to know basis. Was that Arcanist or Archivist? Arcanist. Sorry, A-R-C-A-N-I-S-T. Okay, thank you. Magi person, not archaeology yes. person. Yeah, okay. ma- ma- magical person, not archaeology person, which also is maybe why this is kind of an odd favor because it's not like, you know, you're going to see an archivist or so, you know, a librarian or someone who digs stuff up. You're going to see you're going to see a wizard in the in the magic woods. <laughs> how um how big is the crate? Uh Let's see. The crate is probably about probably about four by four uh, feet. Uh, so like it, it's a not like a huge crate. Like one person can carry it. Maybe maybe not you, but uh, the other definitely people. not me. <laughs> yeah, but uh, it's a it's a fairly big. You know, it's a big package for you, and also the sable wood can be dangerous, and so that's part of the reason that. Uh, Theresia encouraged you to uh, bring your you know, bring your party of invitees with you. Um, also, not least of all, because it would be kind of weird to send away the only person they know. It'd be like being at a party where you don't know anyone. For sure. All right. So, um, where is everyone else uh, as we are uh, driving through the sable wood here? And just for record, I'm picturing this as like a uh, when I say carriage, I'm not picturing this is like an open cart. I'm thinking like a like a carriage with like a front and a back, and you know. And, and inside with doors, which is where the crate is currently secured. Sort of like a traveling merchant car- carriage kind of thing. Yes, exactly. How strong is the roof of this thing? Um, I would say probably strong enough that you were, if you were sitting on it, you'd be fine. It's a fairly sturdy construction, <laughs> and uh, people aren't unused to building things to support clanks. Okay, I'm gonna be purchased up there because if something happens, I would be able to take flight from the top of it, and I'll just be looking around. And this is why we have three yaks pulling. I will have Ao sit at the front part of the carriage um, while Thistledown is riding on the top yak, just holding on to the reins ever so slightly, yes. just in case. <laughs> yes, I, I probably do weigh a lot because I'm made out of stuff like gold and platinum. I'm, I'm fairly heavy. Uh, yeah. It's okay. There's what? three yaks. <laughs> Uh, what do you? What does the orphan look like? Because I'm not. I'm not actually sure. I know. Okay. Um. The orphan is like a suit of fantastic armor. It looks like, and by fantastic, I mean from before the usurpation of the gods uh, mm. by the new gods. And it's like made out of various materials: some magical, some just precious. Like I'm cov- my eyes are literal giant amethysts set in the helmet. Like, and there's a. The helmet has like one of those cross guard face plates that a face should be visible through, but there's nothing but featureless metal and the two amethysts staring back at you. They move when I look at things, uh, but and they are carved in the shape of eyes, but with no pupil or or anything like that. They're just like orbs. These these uh, amethysts. The body How tall is are you? Um, seven and a half feet tall. Goodness. Yeah, I am very large. Uh, I'm. Like I said, I'm probably a solid three, four hundred pounds uh, because, like I said, I'm made out of stuff like platinum, gold, some kind of weird alabaster colored metal that can actually, you've seen me take damage and it, you've seen it regenerate. Like it actually heals uh, if I concentrate properly. Um, yeah, he's, he's just a, he's a big, oh, and I, I do have wings. They're not usually visible, uh, <laughs> but, but like they can like basically transform their way out my back when I take flight and they're, they're, they're like a skeleton of metal. They're like the bones of wings. And then the wings are the, the wings. when they, when they become flying wings, the light, they light up. It's basically like mm. the, the, the pinions and so forth are just light. Uh, so so yeah. you, you stand out a little bit. That's awesome. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm like your extremely showy clank. Like most, uh-huh. clanks, most clanks are, you know, utilitarian built for a purpose. I was also built for a purpose, but that purpose is to, impress everyone with the power of my god and it's very unfortunate that i don't know who my god is because my god died or i could really tell i could do a good job of telling people all about him if he wasn't dead <laughs> and i didn't know anything about him but but you know that's that was my design purpose at least that's what i think it okay was. Hey, being purpose built doesn't mean you have to look boring <laughs> yeah I can think, of, think of me as like you know if you if you decided you were going to get a really fancy car it's kind of like that <laughs> but that's what was great. Uh, no no, no, I'm like a, I'm much more like a Lambo. A Lambo of planks. <laughs> planks. What am I saying? Um, I think I think Arvid is sitting inside the carriage in the shade. Uh, she she's she's not a fan of the sun, even if it's 
even if it's shady under trees outside, there's still there's still more sun outside than inside. So keeping an eye on keeping the an eye out, making sure it doesn't like you know explode or something weird. Is it? She's very curious about that crate. Yeah, but you know, were we were we told anything about like were we told? Not to open the crate. You weren't explicitly told not to open the crate, but you also uh, weren't told. Hey, go! You weren't told exactly what was mm, in it. Uh, yeah, so it's kind of implied not to open the crate, but I, I she's she's pondering this and just you know, looking at it from one angle and then another, and maybe giving it like a little mm. tap to see does it echo? Does it, just you know, like. The kid if it before were a Christmas, Christmas present, you you're like picking it up and shaking yes. it. We got gotcha. you. Yes, kind of like that, but being being very delicate about it. I don't want to. I, I don't want to make it explode or break it, anything. Just I'm very a, curious. It sounds like you're being nosy, and it also sounds like this might be a good opportunity to have our first action roll of the game. Oh no! <laughs> just to see what you can learn about this Christmas present. Do it. Do okay. it. <laughs> All right. So it sounds like you're inspecting the crate and you can make an yes. argument for another stat but it sounds like this would be maybe your instinct stat which is used to perceive sense or navigate okay uh, and to make an action roll grab your two d12s uh, and note which one is your hook die and which one is your fear die and then it if you have an experience that applies here um, yeah, I don't there is a way so. to add that to the roll. Okay. So in that case, just uh, roll your two dice, add your instinct uh, uh, bonus, and then tell me which die was higher. Uh, that's a big old eight with hope. An eight with hope. Okay, cool. So the first thing that happens, um, and I'll do a little aside here to talk about the hangs. First thing that happens is mark a hope on your sheet. You should be up to three Yay. now. Now everyone starts with two. Okay, so... Uh, for everybody listening at home, a uh, quick explainer. Um, the primary mechanic for making action rolls in this game is rolling two D12s. Yes, unsung D12. Um, and rolls in general will have one of five outcomes. Uh, you can either uh, succeed, so, and it's depending on whether you beat the difficulty I'm looking for and whether your hope or fear die was higher. If you succeed with hope, you get what you want, and you also get to mark a hope, which player characters can use to power abilities. Um, if you succeeded, but the higher die was fear, you get what you want, but there is a, it's an op, it's an, I get a fear token, which is something the DM can use, and it also allows me to introduce a consequence into the scene. Um, it doesn't undermine success, but it just makes something interesting happen. Uh, if you roll a failure, but with hope, um, you still get a hope, and I get, you still fail whatever you were trying to do, and I get to make a DM move. But because it's with hope, it's not as bad as it could be. It'll just be kind of a mild consequence. Um, and if you fail with fear, uh, things go badly. <laughs> um, I get a fear, uh, you fail whatever you were doing, and uh, in general, that's a, just a bad turn for you. And the final outcome is that both dice roll the same number, no matter what the difficulty is. It's a critical success. You get a hope, you get to clear a stress off of your character, uh, which is both a kind of a tracker of how much strain you're under and also a fuel for some of your abilities. Uh, and it, in general, you just get what you want and then you get more. So uh, it's crits are a little more common in this system than in other uh, role-playing games. And in general, the dice tend to lean a little more player favor. <coughs> Excuse me. So going back, Liz, you rolled an eight with hope. Mm-hmm. I'm I'm not very that one. Uh, I have a plus zero instinct, which is better than minus one, but still. It's good enough for this. Um so without like taking a crowbar to this crate, there's not a whole lot you can tell. Um it doesn't seem to be uh inclined to explode or tick or anything. Um the one thing you can tell is it seems like there's one thing in the crate. Um it's packed in there fairly securely. You can, you can kind mm. of smell straw through the through the cracks in the crate. Um and it's fairly heavy. Whatever one thing is in there is heavy. Um, although, since you're a rogue and maybe you're used to unsal, you know, um, not not great things being packed in crates, um, it doesn't move or make any sounds like a living being. <laughs> That's good. That's good. Yes, uh, but it doesn't explode. But also, uh, so you're going to feel the carriage start to come to a stop. So the folks outside who are uh, observing the uh, the the what's happening on the trail. Um, <clears throat> as your yaks pull the carriage around a tight corner, um, you see in the path ahead of you an overturned merchant's cart lying sideways in the path before you, blocking your way. Um, there's a scat, like 
all the stuff that was in the cart, which appeared to be like fruits and vegetables largely, is just like all over the trail. Um, and from around the side of the carriage, you can see one of the inhabitants of the Sablewood, a Strix wolf. It's a large creature with the body of a wolf, the face of an owl, and absolutely enormous wings. It looks up at your uh, carriage as it comes into view, and it's uh, chewing on its meal, uh, the hand of the uh, now deceased merchant driving the cart. And it mostly, and it's tilting its head sideways, trying to decide if you all are friends or foes. And then you also see romping around, playing in the uh, in the wreckage, uh, two Strix Wolf pups watching their mother. Uh, your carriage slows, the yaks slow down naturally because there's something in their path. Um, what would you all like to do? Can I try talking to it? You just certainly to... can. You just, <laughs> you know, I, I'm good with animals. I'm just. You Damn. are. That is one of your experiences, am I right? Yes. Weirdly uh, good with animals. <laughs> I thought I remembered that. <laughs> okay, so if you want to make a roll here to see how the Strix Wolf reacts to you, because she is wary, as any uh, mother uh, predator would be, uh, then you're going to roll with your presence trait, which is to, well, it says to charm, perform, or deceive, but in general it's kind of like the charisma stat. And since this, since you have a relevant experience, you can spend one of your hope to add your experience, whatever the number is next to that experience, to the roll. So if you want to do that, oh. go ahead and roll for me. So roll both dice? Yep, roll both d12s, add them together. And if you're adding that experience, weirdly good at animals, spend a hope and also add whatever that is. So I want to add the two dice, the two d12s together? Yes. Okay, so 9 and 6 is 15, and then I have a plus 2 to present, so that's 16, 17. Okay, and which which D12 was higher, your hope die or your fear die? Fear die. Okay. Uh, okay, so she is calm. You, uh, I guess, maybe because of your size, maybe because you're weirdly good with animals, you don't really frighten her. But oh, as, you, as you approach, she kind of notices that you have friends, and your friends are... Uh, I guess maybe more threatening looking than you. And she backs away a few steps, keeping her cubs behind you and makes a noise that can only be described as a combination of a hoot and a howl as of calling to another Strix wolf. And you suspect if you mm. stick around for too long, you might not be alone. Hey mama. Um, I know you just found some tasty treats, but I think it'd probably be best if you took off with the kiddos. Okay. Okay. Anybody else want to do anything while this is happening? I would like to hide. I'd like to, I don't know if I would be in line of sight anyway, but I'd kind of like to, to duck do down. Know, and... Do you know what's happening? Because you're like in the cart, right? Yeah, mm, that's a good question. Can I see things? I know the cart has stopped. Yeah, um, yeah. there's a, there's a door with like a, probably an open window. It probably doesn't have glass, just so you can you know, get air. And it's maybe like a curtain you can pull. Um, it's, gotten, I, I, it's gotten a little more comfortable for you as you get into the same wood because the trees over here are blocking almost all the sunlight. So it's mm -hmm. actually starting to feel a little more homey. Um, I'd say, I yeah, you, you can probably hear this. Done. Sure. Um, I have an ability called uh, Prayer Dice. It says at the beginning of a session, roll a number of D4 dice equal to your spell cast trait and store them on this card. You can exhaust them at any time to use their value in reducing incoming damage, adding to a roll result, or exchanging for that many hope you may give to any player. So could I give her a hope? Um, so what that would do is it would give her a hope token. Um, mm -hmm. it, would, it would not change the fact that the roll uh, had a higher fear die. But she could use it in subsequent rolls. Yes. If she had to make another one, right? Yes, for like powering up experiences or um, using abilities that require hope to be spent. Yeah. So I, I just lost a hope because the fear was higher. Does that mean that I get the hope back again? Well, I, I need to ask, like, how do I do that? How do I give somebody hope? It says that many hope. So I, I don't know if that means like a, one of my die gives her one hope or the numbers that I rolled on them, which were two threes. Like, I don't know how this works. Uh, okay, so what is your spellcast trait as a Seraph? Uh, it's, it's the strength one. Strength. Which strength. is plus two for me. Okay, so um, I would say roll 2d4. Okay. Well, I, I already did. I rolled okay. two and got two threes. Okay, so, um, six so, so you have six. That's actually a really good result. Um, so the way that you can use their value um, for it, so I think what that means is you have six uh, like, you could potentially hand out six hope if you wanted to use them all for that last effect. Okay. Um, I'm going to say you can do them one at a time. So if you just want to dial one home down to a two and give her back the hope she spent. Okay, I fine. do that. 
Okay. okay cool. And I, I, how I do that is I, I stand up to my full height and unfurl, but don't ignite my wings. So I'm not trying to fly yet, but I'm they're out. And I say, may you be found in compassion and may compassion be shown to you. And I want, I, I want the animal to see it, although I can't talk to animals or anything, but I want it to see it and possibly be impressed by me. Okay. So you get your hope back. So I lost a hope, but got a hope back. So I'm still at two out of five. Yay. Okay. Thank you. You did. And uh, Liz, you said you wanted to hide. Um, I will say that you are just, so like you were out of view to begin with. And if you want to try to hide somewhere when this goes on, you are sneaky and you are competent. So you can just be hidden somewhere observing all this if you want to. Yeah. I don't want to get out of the carriage, but I'd like to find whatever space inside gives me any kind of view of what's going on and just sort of duck down. So it's just my little, my little beady yellow eyes poking out of the, out of a window or a crack or something. Yeah, I think the camera on this would just show the outside of the window for the cart, and then there's just these two little froggy eyes just staring <laughs> out of them. Because mm. we remind everyone, uh, Arvid is a frog person, and that is the best. Um, I'm definitely, I'm definitely winning the game here because I'm a frog. A ribbit, one hundred percent. A winning. ribbit, yes. Yes, a ribbit. Uh, Nick is Ao doing something? Yeah. The only thing, because I see that this whole down is talking. I'm not going to make any overt movements. I'm still going to be in the driver's part of the carriage. The only thing is I'm just going to put my hand slowly over the pommel of my short sword. No sudden movements, real slow. Okay. Uh, so the Strix Wolf was wary of you guys, um, but it doesn't seem like you're going to attack her, and you're definitely not going to attack her pups. And so after another moment of careful uh, consideration, she kind of leans down and toots at her pups, and they climb onto her back. And the Strix Wolf wings off through uh, into the depths of the sable, and you're left here alone with okay, this bye. merchant cart. <laughs> uh, she howls at you as she leaves. <laughs> I I will like jump off of the cart and come crashing down, you know, superhero landing style. And then I will walk over and give the poor dead person the last rites of my god, which I only kind of half remember. Um, so it's a lot of last rites with no, like, and for whatever reason, may you be taken care of in the world beyond this one sort of thing. Okay. Um, so as you're as you're moving this driver um, to give him his, his last rites, um, you notice that this... You might notice this, and I don't know if this would jump out to the orphan or not. Um, <clears throat> obviously, well, I am a healer, so I've healed people before. Okay, this would definitely jump out to you then. So, you, touch, so. so you know that his arm and his hand are kind of mingled. These strix wolves are mangled. Excuse me. These strix wolves were picking at it for food, but you mm -hmm. also notice that he has a wound on his neck that is definitively not wolf-looking in that it looks like his throat was slit. And his body and cart were stripped of anything more valuable than vegetables. They didn't kill him. They didn't? No. He has a blade wound on his neck. It would have cut his throat. He would have bled out. Uh, and if you look at the cart, I don't know everything that people in this age find valuable, but I don't see anything at all other than smashed and ruined fruit. Like, there's almost nothing in this cart. Uh, Arvid would like to hop out. And you can probably hear him because he's very yeah. loud. I'm deliberately not screaming when I do his things, but he is constantly very loud and almost always at the same volume and inflection. He doesn't do a lot of emotional variation in his voice. Um, I would like to, you know, is this someone I'd like to see? Is this someone I know? Is this a merchant I recognize? Because I, as a merchant myself, I kind of know around my network. Is this anyone familiar? Um. Do you know, I was going to say, do you have a lot of contacts who go in and out of the Sablewood? Because if so, this very might be, very well might be someone you know. Uh, I have no idea. Um, it, it's it's kind of in the center of this region. You very well might. Yeah. I mean, I, I do. I, I, I think there's a good chance you know this person. Uh, what okay. is, it, it's a human. Um, mm -hmm. What is his name? You're putting me on the spot here. Um, I, I am. One of the... Uh, <laughs> All aside, so you have time to think. One of the uh, pr core principles of any uh, any kind of narrative game, but they also bring this forward in Daggerheart, is to ask questions and incorporate the answer. So other people oh. get to help build this world, not just me. And now I'm stalling for time so Liz can come up with the name well, of this dead human. And go. Uh, his name is Howard, and uh, he usually went by Howie back when I last saw him in the marketplace. Howie got a owie. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Owie got a big owie. 
Uh, I, I wasn't attempting to set that up, but there we go. Howie Elder Thorn. <laughs> That's his name. And, Sorry. and with that, this is, uh, oh, this, okay, I'm going to write that down. It's turned into a real group effort here. I hope I can read these later. Okay, uh, anyone who is currently paying attention to their surroundings, which seems like it might be most of you, uh, make me an instinct roll. I was going to say, as soon as as soon as the orphan started talking about that, Thistledown started looking around because, like, that that sounds like, oh no, this is an this is totally an ambush. Yeah, I wanted to have as soon as he said her ale heard wounded neck off the driver's mm-hmm. seat, swords up swords like hand on swords it's definitely feeling a little ambushy so um what yeah. am i rolling uh, instinct I, would, I would say i would say if one person wants to do it you can kind of handle the role for I, the role group it's, I, it's an it's an instinct role I, really. I just rolled and i rolled double sixes that is oh. perfect that is a crit um so what happens on a crit is a you get to mark a hope b if you had any stress you would get to clear one um but you don't have any yet. Totally not stressed yet. It could happen later. But B, uh, well, that was B. Uh, the third thing that happens is you hear a branch snap in the underbrush, and you turn and you see in the underbrush four uh, thistle folk. These are residents of the uh, of the, uh, the the deeper parts of the uh, the wilder parts of the Sablewood, um, and they're kind of like little, little humanoid plant people. Um, and you notice, um, just maybe when you're thinking, are these friendly or not? You notice that uh, all of them are, uh, three of them are carrying a dagger, and one of them is carrying a nasty little serrated blade, and they are all eyeballing all of you. And they were going to attempt to get the jump on you with their distracted cart, but uh, Thistle managed to spot the Thistle folk. <laughs> this is kind of a funny coincidence. Uh, right away. So He's going to say, so not a good idea, and then go, orphan. All right, so if we were playing at a physical table, what would happen now is I would set down the action tracker, which does not necessarily mean violence is the only answer, but it does mean that we are getting to a point where we want to track things from moment to moment more than in the right hand. So uh, just know that I, I don't actually have a good online representation of this, but basically each time you put it, each time you take an action while the tracker is down, I will put a token on it for you. And then each time I take an action, I have to use one of your tokens to do an action. So right now, you guys are you guys are up front because the uh, cause cause you spotted this ambush. So uh, Orphan, it sounds like you were getting ready to do something. I take to the air. I can fly until my next roll with fear. So until I roll fear, fear higher than hope, I am up in the air. Do they look like they're about to attack or do they look like they're thinking better of it now that they see us or what? Uh, now that they've seen you, they assume that their only way out is to fight. Um, then I will fly directly at them uh, and... I'll spend a hope to pick one of them up and take it up into the air. Oh, wow. So you're going to shoot for one of the ones with the little knives or the one who looks like he might be in charge of only because he has the serrated knife. the butter sword. Yeah, okay. The serrated knife. So the, the, the thief is what that one is. So I basically okay. make an attack roll and then they, I guess they come up in the air with me because there's not a really any grapple rolls that I saw. Uh, nope, that's just an attack roll um, against their against the difficulty to hit them. Is that a I was gonna say is that, is that, a, is that a winged seraph thing? That's so cool. Yeah, winged sentinel. Um, basically, you may spend a hope to take flight into your next round with fear. When flying, do additional one d eight damage to any weapon attack you make. You may spend additional hope to pick up and carry another creature that is approximately your size or smaller. I assume he's smaller than me. Uh, yeah. Yes. So, so yes. Yeah, so I just rolled it. something that doesn't uh, make any sense to me, but what the heck? I have two d twelve. I rolled. Two twelves. Okay, <laughs> that, that is that is a crit. Yes, uh, yeah. that is an amazing crit. Uh, and that would but... be like if you're adding my <laughs> my strength to it for my attack roll, that would be a fourteen. Um, uh, so no, actually, you add them together, that would be twelve and twelve would be a twenty four plus whatever okay. your strength roll up. Uh, plus so twenty four plus two, so it's twenty six. That's well over his uh, his. Uh, his difficulty to hit. So you swoop down on this thief who was not expecting a flying clank today. Um, your attack hits, so you go ahead and do uh, whatever your weapon damage is, plus a d8. Okay, that's a great sword. So I roll 1d10, then I roll another 1d10 and take the highest, because that's what great swords do. <laughs> All right, let's find out if he's even alive for you to pick up after this. <laughs> High roll was an eight, so eight plus two is ten. 
Okay. Yes, that. Oh, wait, but wait, no, I'm sorry, because he's flying, he takes an extra one d8. Yeah. So you you do the extra one d8 because you're flying, and then after that, you can spend a hope to uh, pick him up. Which so you're both spending a hope to pick him up and gaining a hope from this crit. So. Okay. Uh, that's six. Okay. So, so six total plus of... two, I guess, because it's an attack roll, or it's just an added plus eight one d8. I think it's just one d8. So yeah, just, just an extra one d8. So he takes six damage from that too. Okay, so six from the one d eight, and you'd already rolled how much, sir? It was uh, it was uh, ten, I believe, because it was like eight yeah, plus 10. two. Yeah. So you you land with your great sword, and you are reaching out with a hand to grab this thistle folk, and when you do, you realize you have just skewered him. So so you can't really skewer people with a great sword. Um, you have cloven him in half, and he is already turning back into uh like dissolving back into into the plants that originally formed him. Mm. Can I grab somebody else then, or is that it for me? Uh, let me see. Um, ba, ba, ba. Yeah, you can carry another creature that is approximately your size or smaller, so you can grab one of the other ambushers and carry him off from the air. Yeah, you. straight up. Oh, perfect. And then, I mean, I don't know if I can talk. Yeah. I, will, I don't know if they understand me either, for that matter. But I'll say, that was very unwise of you. I would encourage you, in the name of the god who is gone, to rethink your decisions and then we just go up as high as I can get us. Uh, okay. So you are disappearing up into the foliage for this guy. Um, the two on the ground, the one in your hand is just kind of screaming because they don't really get to fly. Um, the two on the ground are, they heard you and they're like, Holy crap. So for the little mechanical, uh, peek behind the curtain for people at home, uh, the way damage works in Daggerheart is you don't. So creatures have a minor, usually a minor, major, and severe damage threshold. And if you do damage over their minor threshold, but not major, they take one damage. If you go over their major, they take two. And if you hit severe, they, they take three. Uh, the Orphan did 16 damage with a great sword attack, and that is over the severe modifier for the Thief. So it just takes all three of its hit points and damage at once, which is why the Orphan just skewered this Thief right off. Um, and now he is carrying the other ambusher. Uh, what... What is everyone else doing? <laughs> In the wake of the orphan flying up and lecturing the thistle folk about their poor life decisions, I want to just run immediately behind like where he used to be or it used to be, and with both swords or sh- both short swords just take a sideways swipe at one of the remaining thistle folk. Nice. Yeah, there's uh, there, there's two ambushers here, so uh, go ahead and take a swing at one of them. And Thistle is just going to say, I told you guys this was a bad idea. Do the Thistle Ooh, guys. <laughs> this isn't good. Uh, this was... So I add the I add them together, and then with the modifier, right? So that would be... Correct. That would be 11, but with fear. Okay, so what happens there is I get to take a fear, because you rolled with fear. Uh, and unfortunately, on an 11, you miss. Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> and I am going to use uh, one of those fear right now to activate the guy you just attacked. You come in with your, your short swords of swinging, uh, but you're maybe used to taller opponents, or maybe opponents who are, I don't know, made of meat. Um, you kind of get a spot in this guy's arm, and you're like, ah, severe strike right where he hits. But no, it's 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 like it's made of knotted vines, and your short sword just kind of sinks right through it. And he just kind of laughs at you, and you feel uh, a on your side and attempt. Uh, he's attempting to stab you with his dagger, his sword, and blows down. Now this will be my first attack on one of you guys. So up in the corner of your character sheet, you will notice you have two values: evasion and armor. Yes. Is your evasion less than an eight? <laughs> or it is less than or equal to. Okay. Uh, I'm guessing you probably have a higher armor value than other than some of the other characters. Uh, I, do you want me to tell you what it is? Yes, because it's about to be relevant. Okay. It's five. Okay. So uh, this dagger, uh, like these these guys are real good at stabbing meat folk. Um, this dagger like bites into you in a weak spot in your armor. And he has rolled 15 damage. So now, what do your damage thresholds look like? Um, that's the little bar under hit points and stress. It, uh, yes, it should have three numbers for major, minor, major, minor and, severe. and severe. Right, okay. So minor is six, 11 is major, and 16 is severe. I think you almost... Yeah, it's... Uh, at, 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 well, he it comes in under your... Under your severe, but right at your major. So if you don't use your armor to reduce this damage, you will take two hit points. But you have armor, 
you can spend points of armor to reduce the damage by each point of armor spent reduces the damage by however much your armor is. So what is your armor value? Five. So I have five points to take away from. Yeah, for each point of for each point of uh, for each point of armor you spend, you would you would reduce the damage by five. Oh wow! Okay. I'm gonna spend uh, I'm gonna spend one armor. Yeah, I'll spend one armor to knock it into the minor tier. Okay, so that knocks it down to a minor. You manage to shift just so you know you you feel the blade start to bite in, and you kind of maybe kind of deflect it by twisting your body just right because you're from like a, you're you're used to defending yourself against incoming damage. So you will only mark off one hit point worth damage. Done. See, see, the numbers sound scary, but uh, in the end, they only translate to one, two, or three hit points. <laughs> okay, so what? Uh, so you're you're now literally tangled in melee combat with this thistle folk. Uh, what are uh, what are Arvid and Thistle up to? Um, Arvid, when I when, um, I would definitely be keeping low and kind of watching what's going on. But when I see uh, Ao get hit, I'm I'm gonna. Uh, rush in and uh, attack the one that attacked him. Okay, perfect. Go ahead and give me an attack roll with whatever your weapon is. Uh, that dice rolled away. Okay. Uh, that <laughs> is... That's a 15... Well, hang on. 15 with hope, I think. Well, let me... Do I add anything for my attack? I add two. So 15, 16, 17 with hope. Okay, perfect. So since it is so it is a success with hope, so first add a hope to your character sheet, and then roll. so much hope. I know, and then roll your damage. Uh, that is one d eight plus two. Okay. okay. Uh, that's six. So uh, six, seven, eight. Okay. Um. Yeah. So you. So while Ao is uh, tangling with this, um, you get in with your daggers, and maybe you're used to weird plant life being underborn or whatever, but you mm-hmm. definitely land what feel like nice solid blows on this thistle folk. He's still going, but he is he is he is hissing in pain as your daggers strike where his ribs would be. Um, and I'm going to mark a stress to make a second attack with my dagger. Oh, I like it. Okay, do it. Yeah. So uh, this guy is hurting my friend. <laughs> <laughs> As Arvid jumps to his defense. Uh, that's a nine with hope. Okay. Uh, unfortunately, that one uh, mm. that one goes a little awry, but it is with hope, so you still get to uh, your. It, it's it pulls oh, hey. closer. Pulls closer. Oh, go ahead. Hang on, I forgot. I have sneak attack. Um, <laughs> of course, you if, do. you're a rogue. If yeah, if an ally is in melee with my target, always add a D eight to your damage roll, so I can do an extra D eight on that first attack that hit. Oh, wow, you can also spend any number of hope before the roll that extra dates. Wow, you have Sneak Attack and Divine Smite in one character. <laughs> wow. wow, and I actually have quite a bit of hope, uh, but I am i didn't think of that, so I'm not Well, sure since you're, it, since since this is the first time you've used it, if you want to go ahead and do it, I'm fine with it. If you want to spend some of your rapidly accumulating hope because you do max out oh. at... Uh, at when, five. It, when it hits that five hope, um, that's max, so keep it flowing. I'm, I'm going to spend one hope to do an extra D8. All right, so roll your two D8. Uh, so that's eight. That's ten. <laughs> uh, the sneak attack alone uh, does is enough to hit his severe. So you are going to take down this ambusher. Tell me how you do it, Arvid. Uh, I like rush in, and I'm I'm pretty small. I think these guys are pretty small. So I'm kind of uh, targets this size are familiar, and I kind of rush in low, and I stab stab. You got it. He just yeah. You your dagger strike home, and he and then just like starts turning into like viney fern bits and just like falling to the forest floor. There's like one left on the ground, right? There is there is one ambusher on the ground, and there is one ambusher screaming in the foliage above you as the orphan takes him for the worst day of his life. <laughs> okay, so I want to fly up close to that last one on the ground, um, and I want to use wild flame. Okay, tell me how that works. Um, you're supposed to make a spell cast roll against up to three enemies very close to you. Obviously, there's just one dude here. And a flame erupts from your hand, dealing 2d6 magic damage to any you succeed against. Um, how do you do a spell cast roll? Is it the same thing? Two dice and then add the spell cast modifier? Uh, yes. And as your, I think your foundation card as a bard should tell you what your spell cast stat is. It's almost certainly presence. Let's see if I can find it. It is. Yes, so you would roll 2d12, you would add your presence, you would tell me the total, and whether fear or hope is higher. Okay, so the total on that, hang on, is um, 8 plus, where's my, 8, 9, 10, 
and hope is higher. Okay, um, so go ahead and mark a hope because it was. Oh wait, and oh, I have a spe- I, I have a plus two to spell cast too. Okay, so is that so a total of 10, 11, 12. 12? Just shy. So you're going to mark a hope because it was hope, but this was a failure. Um, the uh, so this 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 blast of flame just comes out of your hand, and he kind of he was already thinking about running, and he just kind of shrieks and ducks when that fire comes in. <laughs> Um, and I'm going to go ahead and use one of my fear and one of your action tokens to activate this ambusher. And his action is going to be to realize that he is horribly outmatched uh, compared to an unarmed uh, merchant, and he is going to start booking it into the underbrush. Um, okay, what do you guys do? I want to grab him. I can't get away. <laughs> okay. To leave. Okay. Yeah. Go ahead. Uh, make me a uh, so uh, just go ahead and make me an attack roll. So I don't know if there's any special rules for grappling here. Okay, so this would be a 13 with hope. Okay, so mark a hope, and a 13 is good enough to hit him with an attack. Are you just grabbing him, or are you going to do a uh, an attack on him with your short swords, or what's up? Yeah, no, as he turns and tries to run back into the brush, it's going to be like that um, not-so-fast, grab him by the shoulder with one hand, and then short sword like through the lower back. Okay, give me, uh, I was going to say, give me your short sword damage, huh? Okay, so that will be it's a d10, and we're going to do 12. 12, okay, yeah, he, uh, he turns to, uh, he turns to leafy bits in your hand and scatters to the ground, like dead fall leaves. On the ground, it is very quiet. Orphan, you can hear that the, uh, the noise of combat below you seems to have faded out, and all you can hear is the, the flap of your wings and this thistle folk in your hand who has screamed himself hoarse at this point. Did he ever respond in any intelligible way to me? Uh, he's, he's, he's kind of started gibbering. Put me down, put me down. I won't hurt anybody ever. I promise. I, don't, I, just, I, don't. I have your word that you will never you, harm another person again. You have a word. I promise. I swear on my, I you swear know what on will my... happen. You know what will happen to you if I find that you have deceived me and broken my trust? I swear on my roots. I'm going to live a life of peace. I will take, I will do this to you again, except this time I will do this. And I let go of him. Ah! And let him fall, and then I jump down to get him. <laughs> Whoosh, yeah, you guys see that you hear this thistle folk falling to the ground, terrified, and the orphan swoops in and grabs him at the last second so he doesn't die. And just or did you then say I, on the ground so he can flee? Then I descend and I say, We are we are okay with him leaving. I hope so, because the second you take your hand off of him, he is booking it into the brush. Yeah, like I'm I'm gonna just let him go. Like yeah. You know, Okay. Um, unless anybody, unless anybody wants to make a move to stop this guy, he is. Remember, I will find you. I swear on my roots. <laughs> I have no way of finding him. I say to the other people around me, and because I, yeah, I say it fairly loudly, unfortunately, because I don't always remember to modulate. So I have no way of finding. Him. So, so they're all they're all dead. This is a we're sitting here in a mess of like. Three dead, dead and scattered leaves? Three, three dead uh, and one running away. The only sign that there was ever an ambush here at all is some leaves that would look out of place to someone who really knows their dead plants um, and three <sighs> three little weapons um, lying on them. I mean, does it, does it look like this was just purely... So they took everything... Someone took everything off the cart other than, like, vegetables. Yeah, they... Um, yeah, somebody picked this guy for anything he had that would have been valuable other than food. So I want to go look in the direction of where they were, came from to see if I can find a pile of stuff. While that's going on, I want to think about the knives they have and the cut I saw on his neck and figure out if I can figure out if that would have made sense for him to have been cut by one of them. Yeah, um, so we'll do we'll do the orphan first and then this little orphan. You can tell from looking at this, the serrated blade that the thief mm-hmm. is holding has those like nasty ridges on it. And you can see as you look at the wound on the guy's neck, that it's got like those, it, it's got not, it's not a clean cut. It would, this is All very right. likely the blade that made it. All right. Okay. Um, and this will, I will say that out in, uh, not too far, because you 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 saw them to begin with, didn't you? You you rolled the critical success, yeah. and spotted the sandbar, so you know right where they were hiding. Um, right behind them, you find a uh, kind of a bag made out of woven vines that has uh, just a number of like small trinkets and jewels and things that amount to in total about a handful of. Gold. So if you want to take it, then go ahead and mark a handful of gold on your character sheet. Wait, how do I? Do- 
Uh, I believe it's in inventory, but don't count me. Don't don't quote me on that. Equipment. Yeah. Okay. There you go. I was gonna say it's it, so it's like gold, by, gold by handfuls, then bags, then chests, then hordes. Oh, and okay. Yeah, there, she's there got were... a handful. Now she's got two handfuls. Yep, everybody should have one handful just from character creation, but this one now has two as she finds. Uh, More well, interested in is there any is like artifacts or anything cool looking? No, nothing really cool in this guy. He was just possessing some things that he was maybe kind of hoping to trade to the folks in Hush. Um, I I do want to just check the body to see did he have anything in his pockets? Was he carrying any papers? I mean, maybe it's not weird for him to have been going through here, but maybe he had some purpose? I don't know. Sure, also, also can, uh, Arvid's just a little nosy in general. Yeah. Um, also, yeah, you, you while, while Arvid's doing that, is sure. there anything around here that I could use to dig a hole? Or do I have to use my hands? Yeah. Uh, I'd say it would probably make sense for him to have like some kind of shovel or something. Maybe I was going to say, if, so, it's, a, if, if it's, it's a merchant's cart, we should yeah. have something like that. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Uh, and, and also for a merchant moving through the sable wood on a regular basis, they need to carry things to like smooth the trails out and keep them going. He's probably got like a small wood axe for like if brush falls on the trail or whatever. So I'd say you could easily find a shovel in his stuff if you want. All right. I'm going to find a shovel and begin digging a hole to bury him because I don't have access to the materials to build a really good pyre. Sounds good. Arvid, you uh, you rummage through his pockets. You don't really find anything like unusual. Um, you know that Howard um, did uh, trade with uh, villages on each side of the, uh, the Sablewood. So you can reason he was probably just uh, passing through normally and just kind of wrong place at the wrong time here. Mm -hmm. um, what a shame. But how, how, many you wounds, oh, how many hit points did you lose, um, Yeah, One. Okay. Then I don't. I walk up to you and put a hand on you and I say, you are taller than I thought you were, and you heal for like one hit point. What what does it feel like when you're healed by the orphan? It's very disconcerting because if you've ever been healed by like a by a modern healer, like a seraph serving one of the of the new gods, it's usually like it's very laced with their essence. Uh, you cannot feel any divine essence at all. Like there's there is no active divine essence here. It is still a heel from a seraph, but it's like it's a heel from a seraph who's just got a bag of heels that his god left behind before going out for the weekend, and I'm just doling them out. It, it's a very strange experience. It's almost uh, like a noticeable absence of yeah, power. That your, your wound yeah. just kind of knits itself shut, and you're not sure yeah. why. <laughs> I, I, I was gonna say, it sounds like I'm getting stitches with no anesthesia and without the needle. It's just closing, and it doesn't yeah. feel the best. Weird. It doesn't hurt, but it is not. It's a. It's a very. It, they're all the stuff that's usually there to tell you. Oh yes, I'm being healed by the touch of the true gods. None of it. You just get better. I've okay. been to rub my side, and the only thing I'll say is thank you. But how did you not know how tall I was already? <laughs> well, look at you. Like I'm. I'm. A, I, even if you're a normal human size, I'm like seven, seven and a half feet tall. So it's very hard for me to actually look at you. I have to be bending my head or, or crouching. So you, know, you are just, I thought you were like the same size as, as Arvid, but no, you're, you're taller than that. Tiny bit taller. Just Arvid has to like, Go ahead. Arvid has to like crane her neck up to like, look at any of you. Yeah. we got a, we got a party of talls and smalls here. Got, I mean, we got a, we got a tall elf, like, and a small clank, and then three shorties. Yeah. This will <laughs> just like the size of, up somebody's pinky, you know, she's small. If you had stress, that also get rid of one of the stress, by the way. But oh, okay, I don't but, think I had any. Yeah, and that cost me two hope, so I'm back down to two after the various other things. Alrighty, um, and so you, without any, uh, without any other interruption, although uh, there are some uh, lemur toads clinging to trees and watching you with their big beady eyes, uh, you successfully uh bury this uh bury howie in the in the the loose dirt just off the air uh, the, the soft dirt just off the path uh you were did he have one. family i asked that to thistle because it seems to know who he was and i not sorry arvid i don't think i i don't think i would know i i just knew him from the marketplace okay i've seen him trading but and then then all we can do um did the cart still here right yes I'll go up and just, you know, with my, my strength, just punch a big piece of wood out of it and uh, use my fingernails to scratch his name into the plank and, like, affix it to the shovel that I leave buried in the ground next to his grave. 
so that there's some sign of him here. Yeah, it's fairly easy to uh, to to get some loose wood on the cart because they uh, said they tipped it over um, when they ambushed him. So, um, and whatever his whatever he was using to pull it has long since run off. And so, uh, mm-hmm. you can. You so can if there were reins, I can strap really it on or whatever. Just whatever it needs to be done to get it on sure. there. Thistle's going to fly over and perch on the little board and say, "Goodbye, Howie. We'll see you again. Just not soon. I hope. Hopefully, not anytime. We're, soon. we're coming back to dig him up." Like that's I get I look really confused. No, when we eat, oh well, you won't see him again because you're okay. pieces. I suppose that makes sense. Yeah. Okay, and uh, with with that, you all so with the with the woods restored to uh, a, a fairly peaceful silence, and your path opened up again. Uh, you all can be you all can follow the rest. Of, you can follow the path towards the center of the sable wood back on your carriage again. Hey, can I use my prayer dice for myself? Uh, let me see. It says uh, any player, and uh, I, I am a player. You are a player. Yep. Any. Yep. Uh, it can okay. be reduce and can be damage. Add to a roll or exchange for that many hope you may give to your. Yep. I'm going to give myself a hope, so that that's down to four now. Sounds now good. Now I am up to three. All righty. Uh, and while you guys are uh, trundling through the woods uh, up ahead, you see uh, probably the first man-made structures you've seen since uh, you entered. Uh, the, since you entered the sable wood, other than the cart, obviously. Um, off the path to the left is a very large stone pillar uh, carved Ooh. top to bottom in ancient dwarven symbols. And not far past it, you can see, uh, you, you can maybe smell like the smoke of cooking fires, and you can see what look like uh, dwellings not too far in the distance. Um, and you have reached the edge of Hush, this pillar marks one corner of the village. Can I read what's on it? Um, can this will read Dwarven. I don't know. How would I know that? Uh, this is not a mechanical language thing. This is just me asking you, can this will read Dwarven? <laughs> oh, well, the thing is, is she's a wordsmith, so I figure languages would kind of be in her wheelhouse, but not like, I wouldn't call her an expert by any means, any of them, but she might be able to piece something together. Sure, sounds perfectly safe to me. Um, it's it takes you a second because it is a fairly archaic script. Um, the uh, it hasn't been here as long as the Sablewood, which the Sablewood has been around since some say even before the Forgotten Gods were born. You want me to like um, roll a knowledge for it or something? Uh, if you no, I don't think so. This is uh, this is just something that's in your wheelhouse. You're competent enough. It's uh, it's you you eventually piece together that it says in repeating uh, runes, uh, safety in silence and stone. Huh. Cool. And as you're contemplating what that means, the cart drives past the stone marker, and you feel, uh, you know how when you're uh, when, when you're on an airplane and it's taking off, and your ears pop, mm-hmm. um, you ex- your characters experience that sensation very briefly, um, and then you realize that the sounds behind you of the sable wood of the wildlife that you've been hearing since you got here are like muted or silenced in some case, but up ahead you hear the sounds of friendly chatter as if you just rolled into it, which which you... Oh, the stuff outside <laughs> is hushed? You got it. <laughs> okay. And the stuff outside can't hear the chatter inside. Cool. Uh, the trees themselves are unchanged, but just being within the pillars, you feel you feel comforted, you feel safer. This is, this is, this is a civilized place in the world. Um, and as your carriage rolls into the outskirts of Hush, there are some people that kind of turn and wave at you. Um, and the road leads is leading you directly towards a uh, tavern at the center of town where you can hear lively music uh, drifting out. Um, the only thing you really know about this town, though, um, is that you need to find the, wild, the white fire arcanist um, to deliver your package. Um, but you're in a town. What would you like to do? Are there any buildings that look like, I don't know, wizard towers or something like that? Uh, you look around and you don't really see anything that ostentatious. The The tavern in the center of town is actually the biggest building um, in that it is six stories tall and curves around the trunk. Wow. Absolutely massive tree. Um, all the other houses around, um, they seem to be like personal residences or at most maybe there's like a general store for people who need to restock supplies. Um they're like one to two stories total. Hey, Arvid, do you know where would be the best place to ask somebody where this person is? Um, I think I'd probably know somebody who knows somebody. Um, 
I was gonna say, I believe you're a you're a syndicate rogue, correct? I'm a syndicate, which uh, my yeah, my I special mean, ability is that when I arrive in a heavily populated town or city, I know somebody that calls this place home. Cool. Oh no, it also says I have to give them a name. Man, I should have come with a list of names. <laughs> this is why I have a little notebook of names that I literally carry with me. Uh, that would be, yeah, that'd be a great idea. I I don't have one of those. Um, well, if you want, I I can give you a name if you just want to uh, fill out the rest of it. Pull, pull one out of your book. I will. Um, so you are, you know somebody here named uh, Corin Thebs. I'll, I'll write that down. It, it's spelled like your paladin's name, literally. Yeah, you, you just, you've just stolen my name to name someone. Okay. Um, so tell me how Corin is useful, and uh, tell me which of those, uh, which of those things at the bottom applies to them. I, I mean, I, I sort of know them through sort of mer- merchant connections. We aren't like friends or uh, are good acquaintances. So. I, this is something where it'd be a favor for a favor, you know. If if I ask them for something, it's kind of it's good form to give something in exchange, whether that's money, whether that's something in trade, whether that's another favor. Okay, so so you're picking they're going to ask for something in exchange. Mm, yeah. Okay. Uh, perfect. Yeah, I think so. Okay, so what what heritage is corn? See, are, are they an elf? Are they a dwarf? Clank? Human? I'm not naming all of them. <laughs> <laughs> so like you weren't going down the whole list. Um. Yeah, I, I'm I gonna say them. they're. Yeah, I. I let me say I they're another ribbit. Oh, oh, you're you're going something different. I just need a suggestion. Okay. You do whatever you want. Uh, yeah, let's go. Let's go for a blog. Then uh, do some okay. and you know show the whole variety of races in the game. Yeah, I, I like the Furbolgs. They're, uh, I believe the Furbolgs in Daggerheart are explicitly based more off the ones that have appeared in Critical Role in that they are sort of like a humanoid cow. Um, yep, that have... would be like Caduceus and his family yes. and everybody else. Yep, so they have skin and kind of vivid colors and broad noses and long ears. And so it's not very hard to find uh, Corrin because she is a bright shade of pink and she's also carrying a giant barrel of ale on her shoulder. <laughs> and uh, Arvid, do you are you the one are you the one approaching uh, your contact here? Uh, yes, I'll go up and uh, greet them and say hello, Corin. I was Arvid. hoping I could ask for some. I I was hoping you could give me some information. I'm not usually in this area, and I'm looking for the White Fire Arcanist. Oh, okay. Uh, she kind of she kind of taps her chin, and she, with her free hand, she's keeping this barrel of ale perched on her shoulder at all times. And she says, "Okay, uh, so yeah, I can tell you where you, I, I can tell you who can tell you where the arcanist is." Okay. Um, uh, normally, I would want to charge you for this, but I don't even. And she just kind of shrugs the ale. She says, "I'm heading there too. So if you all just want to accompany me up to the tavern, I'll introduce you to him." Oh, that'd be great. Thank you. I'll owe you, you a favor. I like it. Where have you all? Uh, what, what brings so so the arcanist is why you're all here. You've got a got a lot of friends with you this time. You usually travel pretty light. Ah, uh, yeah. What are usually, you going you... to them for? Oh, I'm not going to the arcanist. I'm going to the inn uh, for this uh, oh. to drop off this barrel of ale. <laughs> uh, we're we're delivering a package, and you can never be too careful in the Sablewood. We came oh, across. Um, we've got the package in the cart, right? Mm. Yeah, it's in the uh, it's it's been inside the carriage. I'm not going to leave the carriage then, because if if everyone's going to wherever you guys are going, and the, the, we just would be leaving the thing by itself. So I'm staying with it to guard it. Okay. Oh, I thought we were taking it with us, but okay. Isn't it pretty big? It's kind of a four by four. Be, it might be a little awkward to carry around, even for the orphan. It'd be big for oh, okay. me for sure. Yeah, so That's... I figure until we know where we're going, I will stick around here, and if you guys figure out where he is, no, I meant I me. thought we were going to take the cart. Are there roads through here or? No. Yeah. The uh, the yeah. There's a fairly wide. Uh, the same path you were on just continues to the center of Hush, and then also continues through it, uh, splitting a few times. Um, it will if you follow the road, and that's actually what Corin is going to encourage you to do, walking alongside your cart. Um, it will lead you straight to the Clover Tavern. Okay, but even okay. when we get there, I'm not going in. I'm staying okay. on the cart with the thing, so it doesn't. So no one just tr- comes over and tries to steal it, or at least if they do, I might notice them. 
All righty, sounds fair. Uh, okay, so uh, Corn will kind of duck through the door of the tavern. Um, still hasn't put that there little veil down. She's phenomenally strong. Um, and encourages you all to come in and points at a line, uh, kind of like a closed line that stretches across the entire front of the bar. Um, just above the door, and uh, as you look at the as you look at the line, uh, you realize that everyone inside, uh, newcomers to the bar, take off their shoes and hang them on the line over the bar. Uh, mm -hmm. And she says, "Leave your shoes, and then I'll uh, I'll introduce you to fives. Um, while while we're walking, I'm going to tell Corin about Howie. Oh, she uh, her her ears kind of fall. She says, ah, "That's a shame. He'd been through here a few times uh, trading. I don't think he was due to come back here, so maybe he was just passing through. That's a real shame." Um, Can't be too careful out there, apparently. Yeah, the thistle folk are getting riled up by something lately. Um, things have been a little weird out in the outer reaches of the woods. Uh, so I'm really glad now that you guys made it to Hush. Okay. What do you mean weird? Uh, she says just, you know, a lot of the a lot of the wildlife has seemed like they're on edge. Uh, the thistle folk have been making they've been making more raids lately. Um, they've been more violent. And there's just she kind of lowers her head kind of conspiratorially. She says there's been some real spooky shit out in the far parts of the woods more than usual. I, I swear I saw a ghost the other day. On my mama's hopes an actual ghost. What was it? Uh, I don't really know. It's one of, you know, it, it was just kind of an indistinct, uh, spooky shape. And it definitely was, it followed me for a couple miles. You know, I went to, uh, I was outside of town. I was picking up something from, uh, picking, picking, uh, some herbs to bring to one of the, to bring to one of the local uh, alchemists. And I had to get outside of town a ways. And, uh, you know, I was bringing it back, uh, cause they're, they're brewing something special for the festival. Um, and on my way back, it, uh, like, there was just this presence following me. It was the weirdest thing. It, it, le it, left me alone. it left me alone once I got to Hush. And let me tell you, I've never been so glad to see those big rocks, you know? <laughs> That sounds very unnerving. I'm glad you made it back, okay? Yeah, she says, so uh, if, uh, so yeah, um, Fives here will be able to tell you exactly where the Arcanist is, but let me tell you, mm -hmm. if the Arcanist wants to take you out of town, please be careful out there. Go armed. You might have mm -hmm. to, you might have to protect her. I hear she's, uh, you, sh you know, she's, she's getting up there. So Up there? In, in age. She's, uh. Oh. Okay, is so. Is she a purple uh, like you? Uh, no, uh, she, she's a fairy like you, only a lot bigger. Oh, neat. Yeah. So she says, so she pauses at a table where there is a, uh, there is another clank, um, largely made of wood, although his shoulder plates and his fingertips are metallic, uh, sitting at a table, um, not by himself. He's sitting, uh, with a, there's a small fox bat perched on his shoulder and he appears to be playing some kind of game that uses cards and acorns. Um, you see him moving the cards around. He kind of talks to the talks to the little fox bat sometimes, very softly, and then uh, he goes back to his game. But he uh, so Corin stops the table and she says, uh, "This is Fives, uh, Halathon Fives. Uh, we call him Fives. Uh, if you uh, if you need to find the Arcanist, this is the guy who knows exactly where she's at right now. If you don't need anything, I'm gonna go uh, drop this ale off and then get uh, back to work. Uh, Arvid, don't forget you owe me. No, oh, thanks, Corin. Let me know." If and when I can do something for you. Will do. Goodbye. And You're a very fetching color. Goodbye, little one. And thank you. You have very attractive little eyes. Here. One of her antenna just kind of like wipes one of her eyes. <laughs> like a beetle. It's weird. <laughs> okay. And so this this clank uh, looks up and he says, hello. Uh, I'm. You can call me Fives, friends, if you like. Uh, please take a seat. Thank you. Okay. Why are you called Fives? Uh, it was my uh, it was my last uh, my last name granted me by my creator. Um, there were five of us, and for some reason they did not like the way Halophon Five sounded singular. So we were Halophon Ones, Twos, Threes, Fours, and Fives. Oh, neat! Uh, yes, my uh, my old creator was very much into uh, counting, and I guess that love kind of uh, counting in games and that came down to me. So. Uh, uh, did I did I overhear that you're looking for the Arcanist? Yes, yeah, we have, we have a something to deliver. Them. That's wonderful. Um, she's very busy, obviously, uh, helping prepare for the festival as the rest of us are. But uh, I'm sure she'll be more than hospitable. Uh, we all can you, you know, pass a message to her? Uh, I can. I can. Are you not? Are, her... you, are you all not going to her? Oh yeah, we are going <laughs> to her. I thought if she was busy that she wouldn't be there. 
Oh, I no, for, for travelers who've come this far, I'm sure she'll be more than hospitable. Okay, good. Um, if you need me to show you the way, I can when you're ready to set out. Um, Do you guys need anything? I kind of turn to the rest of them. I don't think so. Whenever whenever it's convenient for you, Fives. Uh, okay, just uh, give me half a second here. And he, he turns back to his game, and you kind of see him pull a little, uh, a, little, a little notebook out of his pocket, and he writes down... What, what you essentially figure is probably the game state and his current score, and then sweeps his components into a bag and stands up. And he says, mm-hmm. all right, are you, uh, you do you have a, uh, are we walking? Do you have a wagon outside? What, uh... We have a carriage. Yeah. Wonderful. Yeah. Uh, okay. And uh, after you've done your task, I do encourage you to come back. The, uh, the food at the club are magnificent, and I'm sure you're hungry after you. It has been a day. I am kind of hungry. I don't eat a lot, but I am kind of hungry. Uh, if you, I mean, you all can stop and eat if you want before you go. But uh, when you're truly ready to go, um, he'll he'll walk outside with you to your cart, and uh, he'll he'll tell you on the way. He says, "We've, you know, we're all, the the arcanist moves her moves her home around from place to place, but uh, we she she we'd be lost without her. You you pass through the ward stones on your way in, correct? Yeah. yeah. Is that the ones that made everything go all quiet? Yes, the uh, the hush stones. She uh, she she's the one who maintains this ward, so the dangers from the sablewood don't pass into town. When you said um, she moves around a lot, do you mean like in the city or like? Oh, oh, she uh, she likes to live off the ground, uh, and she she keeps her home in in different trees from season to season. Oh, okay. Um, currently, uh, since we're just getting ready for the first moss festival, uh, she'll be south of town, past the farms. Uh, hanging in an old sandalwood tree. First uh, Moss Festival. Yes. Uh, it's uh, So at this point, if you guys are kind of heading south, which is the direction we indicate, he'll he'll talk as you'll see what he's talking about. Mm. says, this is uh, our, call it our harvest festival. You know, plants grow a little differently here in the sandalwood and he gestures where you can see like things mm. that look like pumpkins or other crops you're kind of familiar with. They're all low growing, but they all have this layer of luminescent blue moss on top of them. He says, this is the uh, when the first layer of moss grows on the crop in the sunless farms. That means that it's they're starting to ripen for the season. It's, uh, hmm. it's, it's our version of spring here in the woods. If you stay around, there will be a, a number of... Uh, the, the festival's generally a good time. There's There will be a stone painting class. There will be an arm wrestling competition. And of course, and of course, a market uh, with lots of little trinkets. Um, I do you, love a good market. <laughs> and uh, as you go, uh, also the other thing when you guys exited, uh, picking your shoes up off the line again, um, all of your shoes have been shined. Oh. And um, one of you, let's say, uh, Ayo, uh, someone left a small trinket in your shoe. What oh. is it? A small. This small trinket is a stone that I guess would be uh, in in tune with it. You said hearth moss or harst moss? Uh, first moss. First moss. Thank you. Sorry, that's my bad. Yeah, you find a little. Yeah, you find a little. A little perfectly round rock. Uh, one side has a layer of the blue moss, like the uh, crops have, and the other side has a little painted face on it. Just a smiley <laughs> little token. Um, and a note attached that says, Stone Painting Class, Wednesday at 3. <laughs> uh, so I guess from the orphan's perspective, um, you're waiting outside on the cart. Everyone goes inside for a little bit with uh, this Corin, and then they come out a short while later with another clank, much smaller than you. Um, and if no one has any particular seating preferences, he'll probably climb onto the front of the uh, cart with Aya. Uh, yeah, I'm staying on top like a before. Sounds this is back on the yeah. <laughs> They've already taken up their normal places, yeah. and yep. he'll he'll guide you south uh, through the farmlands. Um, yeah, you run through you you pass through the farmlands of Hush. Um, it's this area is also protected uh, by the stones. Uh, so, and you notice that the moss on top of the fruits and vegetables pulses with life. It's it's almost like a like a luminescent blue heartbeat as you pass by. Hmm. Um, and you notice that the trees in this area, they're, they cl- show clear signs of having been people living in unity with them for a long time because there are hundreds of faces carved into the sablewood trees that dot these farms, um, looking in every direction, um, every species and expression that you can think of, there's probably a face carved into one of the trees. Hmm. But finally, you reach one tree taller than the rest. Honestly, the one it reminds you of the most. 
um, is the one that the tavern was wrapped around. It's, it's the tallest tree you can find, and hanging from the tree is uh, what looks like a giant hut. It's just hanging like an overripe fruit from a braid of arm, braid of rope, as wide as a giant's arm, uh, tied to the branch and counterweighted by a boulder the size of a cabin at the base of a tree. Wow. Uh, the stone itself is marked with a marked with a collection of symbols, and the windows of the cabin uh, have a periodically pulse with a soft yellow green light. What would you all like to do? I'm gonna get off the cart. Assuming we're there. Uh, yes, you're there. Is there a door? There is a door. It is up where the cabin is, way above your head. <laughs> so this is gonna gonna go. Are there stairs or anything, or is it just up there? It's just up there. I'll be right back, guys. You have, you have wings, though, don't you? Yeah, and she's like, I'll be right back, and she's gonna fly up there and knock on the door. Which Perfect. Probably it's, doesn't uh, sound very loud because she's small, but still. Yeah, it's really more of an open archway. You kind of knock on the side, um, and you see that the light inside is actually coming from the resident of this hut. And she hears the knocking, and she turns to face you. Even even with her back bent with age, the the white fire arcanist is still a seven foot tall fairy um, with extremely notable firefly features. Um, notably, she is glowing. Um, is and it her she, butt that's glowing? Yes, it is. <laughs> Uh, and she kind of looks at you and she says, my, you're a small one and hobbles across to you and says, are you, uh, are, uh, are, are you with the group that Therasia sent? Yeah, I'm Thistle Down. Oh I'm, I'm with the, with the, the circle bound. Yes. And yes. we have a package for you. Perfect. You are just in time. Uh, and she peers over the edge and she says, oh, the rest of your compatriots can't fly. How rude of me. No. Uh, just one, just one second. Hang on tight. Um, and she kind of, uh, she kind of waves her hand and, uh, the boulder, which previously, you know, which looks extremely heavy to everyone on the ground, uh, the boulder just lifts and the cabin starts lowering and you all are at the foot of this hut, uh, with this, uh, tall firefly fairy, uh, Wait. So the whole thing just kind of came down uh-huh. like yeah, an she, elevator. That's she cool. raises it. She raises and lowers her hut um, by using this counterweight system. And then when she when a new season passes, she decides to move it to a different tree. Um, and cool. this 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 treehouse is surprisingly spacious inside. Um, it's you know it's crowded with potion bottles and spell books and runes and plants and writing. Is it all like open like a yurt? kind of thing yes um and cool. it's it's messy but it's the kind of messy where you can tell if you move something she's gonna notice <laughs> she knows exactly where it is it's right here arvid uh was just like watching the, from the outside the house lowering and it's like this is awesome she says uh okay let's uh let's go ahead and bring you all in she kind of she kind of makes a little gesture and a rune uh, some runes around the outside of the cabin light up and it, uh, it 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 feels just a little bigger than it was before for the for whoever is inside. Hmm. Um, she says, "You've I, I take it you have the package for me." We do. Hey, orphan, can you bring that? Yeah, shouldn't be a problem. It's kind of big. I think I think Arvid would like try to help with the package, but she's she's absolutely no good. She has uh, she's three feet tall with a negative one strength. I'm picturing yeah. the orphan carrying it at like waist height, just like a regular package. And then Arvid's just got like a, a, a hand on the bottom, like I'm helping. <laughs> and on the tippy toes, just like dinky, dinky, dinky. <laughs> Thank you. I say to Arvid as she helps me. Thank you. I, I know I couldn't do this alone. It is heavy. The, 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 the Arcanist smiles. She says, the circle always sends such interesting people. Uh, so, and she gestures, she kind of, she starts to gesture at a table and then she realizes she, she kind of goes, uh, just one second. And she kind of makes a sweeping motion and the things that are on the table kind of scoot off to the side and put themselves away in drawers nearby. And she says, there we go. Uh, go ahead and set like, your package Did she down. pull a Mary Poppins? Yes, she absolutely pulled a Mary Poppins. <laughs> Yeah, I, I put the crate down on the table. Then. Okay, she'll uh, she'll uh, do the Arcanist does kind of a series of taps along the outside of it, uh, and then taps it very gently on top, and almost like a flower unblooming, the 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 sides just lay down on the crate, um, and the straw kind of scatters. And what you see inside is something that Thistledown would recognize, even if no one else does. What is inside is a large 
uh, kind of a pyramid with rounded corner shaped stone uh, with an emblem uh, carved into it of a wheel with seven spokes. Um, hmm. You recognize this as the keystone from the primary archway of the crossbar compass court. And she kind of she kind of nods at it. She says, "Ah, it's time to renewal. Time for the ward renewal." I see. The ward renewal. Ah, yes. And she leans and she says, "Have you ever wondered why the compass court stays safe even when none of you are at it?" You know, not directly. I hadn't really thought about it until you said something. <laughs> she kind of grins and taps her head and says, "Now you know. Uh, the ward on this keeps the compass court safe from outside interference and ensures that only the circle bound and their invited guests are allowed inside. To anyone else, it's practically invisible." I wonder we don't get any party crashers. Okay. Exactly. You just thought everyone was well behaved. <laughs> I she, mean, yes. <laughs> And she kind of laughs and she says, well, uh, you've done good to get this to me and we should be able to get this done in time to have you back for the gathering. Uh, we're going to have to go to a specific place to reinstate the ward. And we're going to have to go to the open veil. Oh. Uh, now, this would be a dangerous undertaking at the best of times. But as I'm sure you've no doubt heard, the woods have been uh, dangerous lately. And this... Uh, well, simple guys are running around... Yeah. Yeah. This will. Uh, this will. Uh, this will attract some unusual things. Can I? Can I count on your assistance? You mean I like mean, ghosts? Ghosts. Ghosts are likely. For real? Oh, they're very real. Like in person. But well, uh, hopefully we won't. But uh, be prepared for the possibility. So uh, if you if if we're ready to set off. Uh, it'll be, it, it's it's a ways to the south, and believe me, you'll know it when we get uh, Does anybody have anything they need to do before we set out? I think we're good. Aren't you hungry? You said you were hungry. Oh, yeah, I am a little hungry. Do we want to go by the inn real quick? I mean, we told five, so we'd stop by. Well, no need to travel back that far. Hold just a second. And she'll, uh, she she opens an, she, uh, opens an, uh, an oven that you did not notice was over in the corner at this point <laughs> and pulls out this, uh, something that smells remarkably like fresh bread, but also fruit at the same time. Ooh. And lifts this, this loaf out. Um, and will, uh, if anybody is hungry, she will cut a slice of this, this, this bread she has made and a just miraculously had cooking at the same time, um, <laughs> infused with local fruits and vegetables. Um, kind of a this will very, take. Very it's filling. not. It's not a slice so much as like you know. A, yeah, it's, a, it's like a hunk. <laughs> a, a, a small, small hunk of crumbs. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah. Um, and regardless of whether anybody takes any now, she will wrap it up in a uh, in a bag and bring it with you for the road. <laughs> no, Thistle was totally hungry. This is really good. Yeah, she definitely gets you like a little thistle sized piece of piece of uh, fruit bread. <laughs> cool. Arvid probably has to like reach up on her toes to to grab at it from this very tall fairy. Oh, she's she's she deals with people of all heights. She's she's not going to make you stand on your toes. She'll I'd say <laughs> she's like that how to talk to short people meme. She's she's elderly, <laughs> but she will crouch down to give you. Thank you. Uh, I was not used to eating good food all the time, so the smell and the taste of this bread is just absolutely heavenly to him he's sitting and for a brief second anyone looks you could see maybe a tear well up in his eye it's that good uh she she just smiles to see it she she did she knows it's good she didn't know it was that good and she turns <laughs> to orphan and she says i'm never sure with your kind do you can you do you want a piece i do not eat okay yeah like i said you never know with clanks and i'd hate to be rude what so, is a clank oh my dearie uh and she kind of pauses and inspects the work on you. She says, you're a very old one, aren't you? Uh, yes. Lord. The fallen ones made me mm. to spread their message throughout the world. Sadly, they died before I could find what the message was. She kind of nods and she says, well, uh, the Sablewood is still a place where the fallen gods are revered along with their usurpers. So uh, maybe you'll find what you're looking for here. And if not, uh, you know, you're, all, you're always welcome here. Thank you. She'll, she'll kind of pat you on your shoulder because this is one of the few people you've met who's probably as big as you are. And I figure she's probably yeah. a little taller, but bent over. So we're at the same eye level. Yeah. If she was full height, she would easily have six yeah. or seven inches on you. Uh, so she'll, she'll kind of lead the way. She'll kind of fold your crate back up again, using whatever magic she used to uh, unpack it to begin with. And, uh, 
we'll jump ahead at this point to the open veil. Um, the arcanist has directed your uh, your travels uh, out 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 of hush, out through the stones and out into the woods. And to most of you, this just looks like woods um, until you come to a clearing, the shape of a perfect circle. The first time you've seen since you entered, the first time you've seen the sky since you entered the sable. Hmm. Arvid pulls her hood down, kind of over her eyes. Yeah, it's uh well. Luckily, it is at this point night, so uh, oh. there there are stars in the sky. Um, very clear night out here. And her she, as you reach, she kind of her ears, her antenna kind of perk up, and she points to the stairs. She's good, good. Stop, stop, stop. Um, this is it. Uh, no, help me out of this carriage. I'm old. <laughs> hey, orphan keeper. Not a, not a problem. I am here to help all who need it. She. Um, she I gladly. jump down and just hold my arm out for her, and she can drive it however any way she wants to. Perfect. She yeah, she uses your arm to help her out until she can lean on a cane that she brought with her, or a staff that she brought with her. She's perfect. So very polite. And the same, once everyone is out of the carriage, um, she does the same trick she did with the crate, where she knocks on it in a few places, and it unfolds like a blooming flower. Um, and then she does the same for the crate. And so you've just got this flat, unfolded carriage with the crate sitting on top of it in the same manner, and then the stone on top of it. Um, the arcanist kind of starts humming, and her body, her her butt, as we all pointed out, uh, glows a little brighter in the nighttime. And she kind of looks over the stone. She's kind of running her hands over to like lose. She says, "It's going to take me about an hour uh, to get ready. Um, enjoy the night air while you can. We're about to be very busy. Uh, at this point in our adventure, we're going to take a short rest." Now, unlike just a, a regular short rest in other games that you, we won't name, um, you have uh, four options that you can do, but you can't do the same thing twice. Uh, you can tend to your wounds, you can clear stress, you can repair your armor, or you can prepare. Uh, preparing describes how you prepare yourself for the path ahead and you gain a hope. Preparing armor is exactly what it sounds like. Describe what it's like for you to prepare your armor or an ally's armor and then clear two marked armor slots. Uh, for stress, describe how you blow off steam or pull yourself together and then clear 1d4 stress. And for wounds, describe how you patch yourself up or an ally and then clear 1d4 hit points of damage. Um, is anyone taking any short rest actions? Or you each have two if you want. Well, I'm, I'm not damaged, uh, but I will spend some time thinking about what she told me about the uh, fallen ones being still revered in the area and try to open myself up and see if I can sense any of them. Not not necessarily the one that made me because I know he's gone, but just in general, try and feel them and, and reach into, to ref, basically to refill myself because uh, I used some of my abilities to heal during the fight. Okay. Um, yeah. Oh, sorry, go ahead. I would also like to prepare just by walking around and just l- examining the terrain. How big of a space is this? Where could things hide? Just kind of uh, getting ready for a potential fight and knowing the ground. So um, Thistle is just going to like go over her book that she has because obviously she doesn't do very well with the whole flame spell thing. So she's going to try and figure out where she messed up. So she does better next time. Hey, I was going to prepare his armor from where the dagger pierced through. So it only took one armor slot out, so I'll get that back. And then I am going to prepare by uh, kind of doing what Arvin's doing, where I'll survey the scenery and then just also sitting near the Arcanist, waiting and watching and getting ready to defend. Okay, Uh, so it sounds like everyone is prepared. The two of you are stalking around... uh casing the joint, I guess. <laughs> um, it is It is unnerving how perfect the circle is here. Like, it's mm-hmm. as if the trees just stopped, and there is just... It, it's just a perfect circle in the middle of the woods with no woods. Um, and in the center of it is the Arcanist, and you don't... You don't think that if anything was going to hide, it would be able to hide inside the circle. Like there, there is not really any cover here. Um, unfortunately for you, maybe if you were hoping to ambush anything that might attack. But uh, as you're all starting to come to a rest, and as it approaches that one hour mark, the Arcanist suddenly lets out a very shrill cry. A uh, combination of surprise and excitement more than anything. Uh, she doesn't sound like she's you know, being attacked or anything. The keystone has responded. Surround me. I have to protect me during this ritual. I have to start now or I'm going to lose the pathway. Hurry. All right. Okay. 
and she starts glowing brighter and brighter and her eyes she kind of is completely lost the magic her her insectoid eyes roll backwards into her head and the whole carriage stone arcanist and all lifts a foot off the ground and as the arcane energy is unleashed you hear an unearthly cry unlike anything you've heard from out of the woods uh, oh boy and uh, who where is everyone at when all this is happening well i would have moved to be closer to the carriage so i was guarding it so that's where i am right now like basically okay, i, I know same. it's up in the right in the air foot yeah this all kind of went flying a little bit and when it went up she went up <laughs> Um, how wide around is the circle? Uh, it's, I mean, enough that it would be a long walk from one end to the other. Hmm. <laughs> it's not, it's not is, like a, it's not like a little place. It's, uh, maybe like, uh, say about an acre. Oh, that's a real big circle. Okay. Yeah, it's, a real big circle. <laughs> it's a real big circle. Um, then I will, I mean, I'll stick close to, close to the arcanist and I'll, uh, keep low. There's nowhere to hide, but I'm trying to be inconspicuous. Okay. Um, yeah, it's a little hard with the shadows um, or with yeah. the lack of shadows, I guess, but it is night, which is helping in your advantage. Um, are you like, are you hiding in the shadows towards the outside of the circle or or just like um, hiding under the wagon or hiding in the orphan's shadow? <laughs> <laughs> I, if there are any shadows around, uh, around the carriage or what's left of it, I'll kind of creep in there and, you know, have my hood over my head to kind of... I mean, if it's, if it's like a foot in the air, you could kind of like sneak oh, yeah, under true. it. Yeah you, yeah. Can, true. yeah, you can slide underneath it because you're fairly short. And the 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 Arcanist herself is a light source now, so since there's light coming from up above, the carriage mm-hmm. is casting more shadows. So yeah, you can you can you're 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 sneaky underneath the cabin <laughs> or the carriage. Excuse me. Anyone in contact with the ground begins to feel it rumble, and you see two things at once. One uh, out in the distance, you see these two indistinct, like dark brownish black shapes float out of the woods. I would say they were humanoid, but they don't even necessarily have that much shape to them. Oh no! Um, and then from the ground, you hear a clattering sound, and then you see the hand of an ancient skeleton. First one, and oh. then two, and then three, and then four of them begin pulling themselves out of the ground. Oh no! Um, and I am going to put the action tracker back down now. <laughs> um, you are facing off against two wraiths who are in the distance and four skeletons who are within uh, close range of you. Just to remind you all how ranges work in this game, there is melee, which is exactly what it sounds like. Uh, very close, which is anywhere from five to ten feet. Uh, close, which is where these skeleton, or uh, close, which is where these skeletons are, which is something like ten to thirty feet, and then far, which is anything past that, and as wraiths are. So right now, the wraiths are at far. Yes, the wraiths are at far. The skeletons are at close, and you are all near the arcanist. Um, so I'll tell you a little bit about how also this is going to work. Um, I have a I have a countdown die for this ritual. Uh, each time something happens that progresses towards the end of the ritual, I'll tick it down. And your goal is to protect the arcanist until she finishes. Uh, with that said, what would you all like? Okay, I'm prepared. Thistle is prepared and wants to like move from close to very close to those skeletons and try the wild flame thing. <laughs> all right, let's give the wild let's give the wild flame finish. Are you going to the your are you doing it to a skeleton? Is that what it is? Yeah, it's it's up to three enemies, so I'm going to try and hit three of those skeletons. Oh, yeah. Yeah, shit. Nuke me, nuke me some skeletons. Let's get it. <laughs> okay, so it's it's the two... It'll be two, it... 2d12 plus your spellcasting modifier, which for you is presence. Okay, 2d12... Wait, where's my 12s? Okay, so that's <laughs> 9 and 6, so 15 plus 2, 16, 17, and then two for the spellcast roll. So, wait... 15. 19. Okay, so a 19 with, is it hope or fear? Uh, hope. 19 with hope, nice. I think I'm rolling real good on the hope side. Okay, so uh, a 19 is good enough to uh, to land your fire this time. Your study paid off. So take a hope and then roll your damage dice and tell me how much damage you do to these skeletons. Actually, take a hope because my hope is full. Oh, is there anything fun you can spend it on while we're here? Do you have to spend hope to use the ability? No. No, it's just one of her three abilities granted by a code. But probably one of your uh, bard abilities. Would I was gonna be say I can do something else. Um, so wait, skull. Oh, that's a six. Okay, so um, ten. Uh, so they take tel- ten. Yeah, all uh, three of them take it's ten each. <laughs> okay, so 
your studying really paid off. You just unleash this burst of spell fire, and three of the skeletons just ignite and turn into blackened brittle bones <laughs> and are gone. She claps her hands. She's very, very pleased with herself. And as soon as you clap, uh, you all feel a rumble from the other side of the carriage, and two more skeletons pull themselves out of the ground on that side. Mm-hmm. Uh, it is now... I mean, who who, who wants to go next? We all do. So these new skeletons are also in close range? Yes, they're in close range, uh, oh. separate from the... Uh, can, I, can I do the spend yeah. a hope thing? I'm sorry. Oh, yes. Yeah, sorry. What was it you wanted to do? Um, I'm going to go ahead and spend a hope to cast um, Mysterious Mist. So it's a temporary fog that encircles a stationary area up to very close range to my current location. So what I'd like to do is like put it around the carriage, if I can. Ooh, okay, sure. Um, sorry, let me just and everyone, that real quick. Yeah, and everyone that's within it is hidden to anybody outside of the fog. Yeah, that's perfect. Um, up okay. to very close range within your... Yeah. I don't so Arvid, I you're hidden, and also um, Miss Miss Arcanist is. Hidden. Yeah, anyone anyone mm-hmm. who was near the wagon is now hidden. Um, the fog is glowing in an unnerving way because the Arcanist is inside, <laughs> lighting it up from the inside. So, it's, mm-hmm. but but to anybody on the outside, it's now just this big glowing cloud of fog. Yay! That was a good use of hope. Okay. All right. What is uh? What, what what's anybody um, else doing? Well, I guess I'm going to go for a skeleton, and um, I, so I have a rogue thing that if I'm if I leave hidden to make an attack, the roll has an advantage. So can I like leap out and rush for the nearest skeleton and just stab stab? Sure. Um. So there was the fourth one that popped out of the wagon that did not get mm-hmm. ignited by or up out of the ground did get ignited by thistle. You can rush straight for it and stab it. The way advantage works in Daggerheart is in addition to your two d twelve that you're rolling, you're also going to roll a d six. Mm-hmm. So in the end, you'll be adding your two twelve sided dice, your d six, and whatever your weapon modifier <laughs> is uh, to hit. So uh, go ahead and give me that roll, and then tell me if it was with hope or fear. 14 with fear. This is the first time I've rolled fear. I know. I have not been getting a lot of fear. Okay. I know. But luckily for you. How many do you uh, have? Me? Right yeah. now Right now, I have two fear. Um, Only of, two? Yes. I think I gained two and spent two in the previous Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> or spent three. So I'm back up to two with that fear. So five total. Okay, cool. My count is correct. Sorry. I'm, yeah. I'm counting something on the side here. Okay, good. Um, and... Yes, that is good enough to uh, to to land on that skeleton. It was not expecting someone to come rushing out of the fog, wielding daggers at it. Uh, go ahead and roll your damage, and don't forget you do get your sneak attack on. So that's four damage from the base attack and seven damage from the sneak attack. You were not sure how daggers were going to work on a skeleton, but you just lunge at it and break these old brittle bones, and it just it collapses around you with a yeah. weird rattling. Oh, that works better than I thought. Um, uh, yes, uh, however. Uh, because it's fear. <laughs> it is fear. Everyone loves howevers. Uh, okay, so I'm going to spend a fear and two actions, and I'm going to use the fear ability on the ancient skeletons, which is group attack. Uh, the other two skeletons, seeing you pop out and attack, uh, rush around the wagon towards you, and uh, so what, what happens is I spend the fear, activate every ancient skeleton within close range of a target to move into melee with you. Uh, uh, vanish! Things. I'm going to hit my vanish button. <laughs> oh, I, no! If I had one of those. Uh, unfortunately, you don't have a vanish button, but what you do have is 10 damage. Oh, uh, okay. Away. Uh, um, what's, Can I use I the I am your shield ability and take... Well, I have an evasion of 13. Is that... Uh, in this case, the way the fear ability works is it does not roll for damage or attack. They just deal five damage each. Uh, I think I am your shield might still work, though. I think I am your shield um, might work. What is that? Ha- uh, let me see. That what? is a guardian. Yeah, it's one of the guardian abilities, and it says, when an ally very close to you is going to take damage, you may mark a stress and stand in its way and take the damage instead. Reduce the damage by a value equal to your strength trait. You may also reduce the damage by spending armor slots. Uh, so at this point, she would be a little far away, but if you want to spend a stress to get there in time, I'm okay with that. I can I can also spend an armor to uh, bring it down to minor damage. So I mean, I'm not I'm not in too much distress. 
Okay, Just so you know. so you can use your armor for one of them by marking off an armor and reducing one of the one of the five damage. Oh, so it's chunks. okay. So it's three yeah, it's, individual it's attacks. Hmm. Two two discrete chunks of damage because you and you and Thistle have taken out four of the skeletons. You just have the two that freshly rose. That oh, okay. So it's it's two skeletons, each of them doing five damage. Correct. Um, okay. So you can reduce one of them with your armor, and uh, you can IM your. Uh, sounds like uh, Ao wants to IM your shield. The other one, there it is. And Marcus, yeah. Uh, if you, so I would say if you want to do that, Ao, and you want to mark two stress to do it, that's fine. One to represent kind of suddenly rushing out of the fog to protect her, because otherwise she'd be Arvid would be a little too far away for this normally. I will. I will burn one armor to bring it down to minor. Uh, that will bring one of the attacks below minor damage, so I don't have to mark a health. Okay. And AO is going to, it sounds like, jump in the way to take the other one. It is reduced by a value equal to AO's strength trait. That's and uh, a, plus and, two. And AO takes the damage instead. Right. And then you can further reduce it by spending armor if you want. Yeah, I'll spend one armor slot to... Okay, so um, I believe that reduces it to zero. So what happens instead of any hit points of damage, you just take one point of stress. Dope. It's uh, Thank it, you. it's a little bit of, it's a little bit of strain for you because you're suddenly you're basically going from stopped to go suddenly, but Arvid just as these skeletons rush up on you and you're blocking one with whatever armor you're wearing, uh, something lightweight it sounds like, and then suddenly mm. Ao is here and Ao is protecting you. Yeah, just jumping right out of the mist with bra- one of my uh, arm bracers out, catching the first damage on it, and then just shaking it off. Very nice. Uh, okay. When you do that, one of the wraiths at the edge of the woods makes this kind of horrible uh, sound um, that I'm not going to attempt to replicate with my pitiful human lungs. Um, <laughs> and you see it kind of raise its hand towards you, Ao, and this almost like a like a weird wave of energy uh, starts to connect the two of you. Does a twelve uh, pass your evasion? Yeah. Okay. Um, what happens is this line touches you. Your whole body feels cold, um, and you feel like some of just some of your very essence start to drain out towards the wraith, who suddenly starts to look a little more alive. Um, this will be six damage before any reduction, as the wraith drains some of your life. It has. I mean, that's exactly your minor, isn't it? Yeah, it is. So that kind of is one, right? Uh, if it's exactly your minor, it would just be one hit point of damage. Yes. Yeah. So that would be that would be one hit point down or mark. Okay. Uh, okay. What is anybody else doing? Then? Well, I'm going to take to the air. I mean, also Ao can still go because the thing he used is something you can just use when someone else's turn, right? Yeah. Also true. Ao, did you want to do something? Yeah. Do you want to go? Oh, uh, yeah. Go? I would just say that after grab after catching the damage, um, draw what I already have my one short sword drawn instead of two so taking a swipe at the remaining uh one of the remaining skeletons sure uh okay so there's uh we'll say the one that you blocked you're taking a swipe at it go ahead and roll an attack for me that is going to be a nine with hope Ooh. uh so you do get to mark hope which is good but you do not uh land the hit which is bad (laughs) Mm-hmm. Um, full of potassium benzoate. Yeah, it uh, it with a with a. Uh, <laughs> I was gonna say with a surprising amount of agility, maybe aided by that potassium benzoate, it brings up its rusted ancient sword and blocks your short sword. And for a second, you're just face to face with the weird like red sparks in its eye sockets, uh, and you are you are momentarily locked in a clash with the skeleton before it kind of shoves back against you. Uh, who, who's who's doing something now? I'm going to go up. Again, like I'll just start flying. You are up. And I'm going to point at the one that shot the uh, connecting ray towards our AO. Okay, and I'm going to hit I'm going to hit it with bolt beacon, which means that like radiance, like a kind of pale blue radiant light swoops in around my arm. It's like literally like being generated from my arm. And if anyone is looking, they can see my hand literally just all my fingers just go back way, way further than a human or any living thing could. They basically just get out of the way of my palm telescopes open. And there's this noise. And um, I fire a bolt at the one that got AO. Okay. So give me a spell cast roll. I believe. Uh, I've rolled two ones. Uh, that is, believe it or not, a crit. 
Okay. As a, yeah. as a critical success. Okay. I'm just going to take a real quick thing here. I think you get to do extra damage. Um, was that a hope or a fear, or was it a double? Oh, yeah. Um, it's a crit, so he gets to... So, so it was, it was two of the same dice? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Ones. Double ones, normally your heart goes, oh, no, and then you remember in dagger heart, that is a critical success. That's amazing. So first things first, if you have any stress, clear one, If you okay. and okay. then give and then add a hope, okay. and then it says on a success, spend a hope to send a bolt of shimmering light towards them. Treat it like mm-hmm. a ranged weapon dealing, and this is where one of the weird things that I'm going to give feedback on comes in. It says dealing D8 magic damage, but what that actually means is I think it's equal to... You actually roll a number of d8s equal to some value. It's not just a one d8, and I'm trying okay. to remember what it is. Let me. I, I will look on that. Real quick. All right. I will wait. Uh, my spell crafting thing is my strength, which is a plus two. Okay. That uh, then that did succeed. So um, sorry, I'm searching this giant document here to try and remember. Uh, All 300 pages oh, for one line of explanation. Yeah, it's uh, so much. Um, yeah, there is. I believe. Yes. So on a critical, in addition to the damage you would normally roll, you just get an extra die that is at max value. Uh, here it is. Critical successes and damage. If your attack rolls a critical success, roll damage as usual, then add extra damage equal. Huh. Roll extra damage equal to the maximum potential value of all your dice rolled together. That sort of it. So you have a proficiency, and I don't know where this is on your sheet, of two to begin with. So when you see mm-hmm. something that doesn't have a number before it, you're rolling proficiency number of that die. So you're okay. gonna so you're gonna roll two d eight and then add sixteen to it. <laughs> okay. Oh my um, god. Four d eight. Uh, four and six, so ten plus I guess two because of that's my spell casting attribute. So. Um, yeah. I don't know if it actually does add. It doesn't say it does. No, it's just treated as a ranged weapon that deals the. It just deals the flat magic damage, and then it would, it would also make them temporarily vulnerable. Yeah, ten oh. plus t- uh, sixteen, so twenty six damage, and yep. they're ter- they're glow they're glowing brighter and becoming temporarily vulnerable. Only one of them, I think. I don't think I can shoot at two of them, so it's just one of them gets that. Uh, yes, I believe you towards a target within far range. Yep, that did it. So you. Yeah, you blast this wraith with this holy damage, and for a moment, its form like dissipates, and you almost think you've destroyed it. Um, it does reform, but it looks it looks weaker than it did before it even did the the magic drain in it. it makes this horrible <laughs> sound at you. You may leave, or you may die. And since you've died once, you'll be guess it'll be second death. I'm, I don't know how it works for you. <laughs> it just moans insensate, uh, but you you blasted the living crap out of this thing. Um, for the record, that was over their severe damage modifier, which is the highest you guys have seen so far. That was amazing. Uh, <laughs> what is what? Uh, actually, hold on. Yeah, I was like, I was peeing myself when I rolled two ones. <laughs> you know, no like I was like two seemed, ones. It seems so bad, and then you remember the crits, and you're like, "Oh, crits are good." Uh, so the other one um, that you didn't blast is going to temporarily take advantage of the fact that you are glowing and flying in an obvious target to attempt to do that same life drain trick. Uh, does a sixteen get past your evasion? Oh, easily, easily. Yeah. Okay. As I, as I remember, you're kind of like the flip side of Arvid, where you have like no evasion but a lot of armor. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, okay, then it will be a total of eight damage as it begins okay. to drain, I guess, the energy from you. All right, I'll t- I'll reduce yeah. that by six. Oh, wait, no, it's just one success. It's it's not over my major, so it's one hit point. Yeah, it would just be, if it's between your minor and your major, then it's just yeah. one. I'll reduce it by one, so he does nothing, because I've got the prayer dice. Okay, then you take one. Oh, yeah, you have the prayer dice. That doesn't even net you a stress. That just nets you no damage. Yeah, just, <laughs> I'm like, I said no. Yeah, the life drain just kind of like you feel the magic kind of fumble its way around mm-hmm. you, but it's not used to it, it doesn't know what to do with things that are animated animated by divine energy. It, it maybe like lashes out against to prevent this from happening, but whatever happens, that wraith does not get any life off of you. Okay. All right. Who who wants to do something now? Crick got a hope, right? Uh yes, Crick gets you a hope. So I spent a hope, got a hope back. Okay. I'm like I'm yo yoing at three hope. <laughs> yeah, you keep spending them and then rolling hope and then getting them back. It's kind of amazing. What um, else is out there right now? Uh, so you've got so you've still got the two skeletons. Um, Ao is kind of locked in melee combat with one of them, while the other one is menacing Arvid. Um, there is a wraith that is still trying to pull itself back together, and it's still kind of glowing with blue energy. What you know is that that one is presently vulnerable. Um, 
and the other wraith has not been touched, but also has not managed to actually uh, do any damage to... Uh, How close are the no. wraiths? The wraiths are currently at... Uh, so for anyone at the wagon, they would be far. Since you guys have moved out to close, they're probably close to you. Okay. Um, is that other unoccupied skeleton that's menacing? Arb is it very close to me? Uh, it would be very close to... You could easily move into melee with if you wanted to. Because you and Ao and Arvid and those two skeletons are kind of all in a pile can I, right next to each can other. Can I do another wild flame? Is there like a limit? You can, you can keep doing it as long as you want to. Okay, I'm going to try and smack it with a wild flame. Sure. Um, I'm, so since, are you, okay. You can hit up to yes. three, right? Yeah, you can hit Oh, uh, up to three. Them, so, yeah. yeah, I'll try and hit both of them. Why not? You've All got right. advantage. No, you don't. Never mind, sorry. Yeah, uh, the wraith. They would have advantage um, on the wraith, but it's not. So that's a uh, third. 13 on a hope die? I got a 12 on the hope die. That was nice. 13 with hope is enough to hit them yep, both. Yeah, but it, it, there's plus 2. So 13, 14, 15, 17. <laughs> okay. Uh, perfect. You need you need a 12 to hit these guys. So go ahead. Okay, roll, cool. Go ahead and roll me some spell fire damage. Okay. Just like this tiny little flamethrower flying <laughs> in the <middle> of... <laughs> That's 9 damage to each of them. Uh, yeah, so as the as you're all like bathed in this weird pulsing light from the fog with the Arcanist behind you, uh, suddenly you have the fire right there with you as uh, Thistle blasts two more of these skeletons just out of existence. <laughs> um, I remembered how to do yeah. the thing! Great work, Thistle. <laughs> Y'all are doing real good. Uh, okay, does any... Uh, that doesn't so, do anything so, about the wraiths, but... You're surrounded by scorched skeletons uh, that are dead. Um, there are two wraiths out at range. Um, one of them, the one that's uh, the one that's not vulnerable, is actually going to try to close into... Uh, it's going to get closer to melee. Uh, and it's going to attempt to life drain the little fiery firefly. Uh, oh, no. Not a firefly. Oh, no. More, more like a beetle. Yeah. Um, but I am going to guess that a six does not get over your evasion. <laughs> no, my evasion is a nine. Yeah, that, this, this, that beam Which of light. Which ordinarily would be terrible. <laughs> it's, it's like spectral tendrils like lash out, um, and you just flit through them effortlessly. Cause you're flit through small. them. I'm just like wagging a finger. No, <laughs> no, no. <laughs> All right. Uh, what are you guys up to? AO or what are you guys doing? I want to, after, after the Wraith misses. Um, thistle down. I would want to pull out my second short sword and then attack. All righty. Um, get, get. I would like I would like to jump in like right before you do this and use right. inspirational words in which I can impugn my speech with enhancing power. Mark a stress when you recite your words and choose an option from the list below to grant an ally who hears it. I can I can heal a hit point by talking. I. What do you say to? Uh, yeah, go ahead. And mark, go ahead and mark your stress. Heal a hit point and tell me what you say to Ao. What magic, it's, inspirational words close Ao's wound as they lunge towards this ghost? It is going to be an inspirational speech. You helped me. You came in and jumped in and helped me, and that was so impressive. Thank you. Thank you. You can do this. You've got it. Just, just do do that thing where you don't where you don't actually take damage, and you you can do it. <laughs> Does this healing feel as bad as the other time? <laughs> no. It's, it's, I mean, it's probably, it's a, it's a spell, and I, I mean, it probably feels like just being kind of bolstered, like, you know, a good inspirational speech. I can like, do it. Yeah. I can do I, this thing. I yep. can do it, and also I heal a hit point. Yeah, it is a, it is a grace ability, so I imagine at first it almost just feels like, you don't even notice you're wounded anymore. You're like, yeah, I can do this. And then maybe like while you're distracted, the magic kind of heals you back up. So I want to point out at this point, I've been stabbed. I've had the life drained out of me and I've, I've been through a lot in the last bit. So it's just, I feel better. And just the a half smile of like, thank you. It's been, it's been hard. <laughs> It's been, it has been a rough day. It's been rough being so strong and tough. I, uh, I've got your back. All right, uh, Ao, but I believe you had a stabbing that was about to happen. Uh, that's going to be a 15 with fear. Okay, uh, 15. So that is a with a fear, but 15 is good enough. All okay, right, now. Some damage. It, Wait, was that hope or fear? Fear. Okay. 
And then um, damage is going to be nine. Okay. Um, so you you slice at this wraith, and unlike when you were dealing with the you know the the brush, the thistlemen before who were made of brush, or the skeletons were very solid. It occurs to you as you're swinging your swords that this might be the first time you've fought a completely incorporeal entity with your swords. You feel it kind of give purchase, like if you were hitting a physical body, but you feel like you're not doing as much damage as you could if you had something magical. Um, mm. In game terms, this thing has resistance to physical damage, and so your damage has dropped too. I figured. Uh, and when you do, uh, there is going... When you, when you slice it and you're still in range and you're pondering, how did this happen? Um, this wraith while you're contemplating the choices that led you to this place in your life, reaches out a hand towards you. And it does a... Yeah, 22 definitely passes your evasion, right? Yeah, that's the scene. <laughs> um, so go ahead and tell me, as it, as it places a hand on your cheek, uh, please describe a terrifying moment from Ao's childhood. Oh, no. Um, a true terrifying moment uh from Eo's past was when the religious order that he was tasked with protecting and serving came under attack from a rival order and there was a very brief moment where he realized just how surrounded he was by enemies and it was one of the first times that panic truly thoroughly gripped him to his core and in your in your mind as this wraith touches you you relive this memory suddenly and it's like you were there and you feel the panic and you feel the adrenaline and then you feel the panic form almost like cold physical tendrils in your mind and then you snap back to the present where you are taking 14 magic damage and are vulnerable until your next rest you can resist you can lower the damage with armor as always yes i gonna spend one to knock that into minor okay and as i remember you are a vengeance are you a vengeance type guardian do i have that correct uh yes vengeance sorry okay so there's a rule we should have been using and we haven't yet when you're hit by an enemy in melee range and use an armor slot to reduce the damage you immediately do damage to them equal to your armor got it okay so now that that's minus two that'd be three uh sorry was the minus two? Oh, the three um so you spent two armor slots already okay I don't think armor slots actually reduce your armor value. Yeah, the armor do, the armor slots don't reduce the value. It's just, oh, yeah. okay. I didn't know if we were supposed to be using the armor s- slot value after you reduce them, or just the base armor value. Just, just the base, have three base slots armor that you value. Can yeah. Use to reduce, and after that, so it'd be like anymore. five, yeah. right? Yeah, it's yeah, like, it, like it has it's like it has three charges to reduce with, but you deal five damage um, back to it. So, what does it look like as you push this thing away? Uh, in a very just clear panic moment. Despite seeing the swords go through it, I'm gonna headbutt it. <laughs> it, is a love it. Panic, it is just a pure panic reaction after having a traumatic memory ripped from my brain. I love it, and I think in your anger and with like the residual like traces of its own magic, like this, this hits with full effect, and you headbutt this thing, and it it actually backs off in surprise. Um, like it, it's still in melee range, but it's very surprised that you snapped out of it that quickly. Quick question: um, mm-hmm. Can I add one of my experiences to as a just a, it's a straight plus one to that uh, to that role? I don't know if I think how I read experiences, it's up to you. Um, in this case, there wasn't really a role to it. Um, okay. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They're usually just for like actually making um, the duality die rolls. Okay. Okay. All right. Who's next? Uh, I don't know if anyone else went. Uh, I mean, everyone else is already gone, right? Yeah. Yeah. So I think I, I might as well go. Uh, there, I I went up like 10 feet. So they're still in close range to me down there. Uh, yeah, especially uh, I would say one is close, one is very close. Assuming you're over your compatriots, because one just moved into melee range with. Uh, okay. I have to do this. Do this memory delve. All right, then I'm going to fly at the vulnerable one. Okay. Yeah, that's the um, one that is. That's the one that's like, close. And I'm going to make a usual attack against him, just with my great sword. All right. Uh, yes. So make an attack, and this is an ad- at advantage because of the which means you roll an additional d6 along with your d12s and just add it. Okay, uh, this is with hope. It's 8 and 9. 9 is the hope die. 
So that's uh, 17 plus 4, so 21 plus 2, 23, all told. Uh, 23 with hope. 23, 23 with hope absolutely hits. So mark a okay. hope and roll your damage. Oh, you mean I got a hope? Okay, I thought you were telling me to get rid of hope. Yeah, no, if you, uh, if you made a roll with hope. No, no, um, I understand. I, I figured it out at this point. <laughs> um, just took me a second, sorry. All right, um, so this is the weapon damage, which is uh, 1d10 plus 2, and I roll 2 die and take the better one, and then an additional d8 because I'm flying. Okay, uh, 8 plus 2 is 10 plus uh, 6 from the d8, so 16. Okay. Uh, okay, so 16. Uh, just like with uh, AO, though, as you attack it with this physical weapon, um, even though it's... Uh, it's just a it, great sword. I understand. It's yeah, physical damage. Yeah, its body is still like rippling with the blue energy from your attack, so it's easy for you to hit it, but it, it still feels... Uh, uh, it, it still resists some of the damage. You do end up dealing another hit point of damage. Okay. So I have a question. Oh, I wait a minute. I have an answer. <laughs> All right, before, you, before you ask, yeah. um, let me look at this to make absolutely sure I'm doing this right. I can spend an additional hope to pick up and carry another creature. Can I pick this thing up? Uh, you know, I think since you're doing it via your Seraph magic, yeah, I think you can. All right, I'm spending, I'm spending the hope to lift it and take it up with me. Anybody watching against all odds, the orphan has picked up a ghost and is carrying <laughs> it. Okay. Uh, go ahead. So I have a question. I have an ability called Magic Hand, where I can reach out with a magical hand, the same size and strength as my own, to anywhere within far range of me, right? Okay. Wild Flame makes a flame erupt from my hand. Can I use my Magic Hand to cast Wild Flame? You know what? Sure. <laughs> okay, so... <laughs> Why not? It's cool. There's a wraith like that's in far range, right? Uh, it's in close range to you now, because uh, oh, okay. well, well, yeah, because because there's one that, be. there's there's one that moved in and it's in amongst the little melee pile that was with the skeletons of you, yeah. and Arvid, it, and Ao. It has to be very close for the for the wild flame, but I don't want to get close to that thing. Oh, you're so, with, like, so you're, you're there's one right there in front of you. Yeah, you're within very close, very close, oh. is, very close is within what D and D would consider reach. <laughs> It's well then, kind of, it's I kind don't... of terribly named, but it's anything like melee is melee range and very then close I don't need is to do like the, the, wild, the magic away. hand. I don't need to do the magic hand thing. I can just cast wild flame. So I'm yeah, at this point, that. you just do the magic hand thing because yeah. you want to. But yeah. you, know, you can just you can just go ahead and try to light this ghost up if you want. Um, do you also want to try to uh, since you can use it against up to two targets? Do you want to try to use it on the one the orphan is carrying away? It has to be one that is very, it has to be three very enemies close. that are very okay. close to me. Okay. Yeah, so I can't hit that one, but I can hit this one. And that's a 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, but fear. Okay, well, I get a fear. I, know, and I haven't got a fear roll yet. I get a fear and you get to light it on fire. Okay, <laughs> so, so I'm going to... Okay. Six. Six damage? Yeah. Okay, that's, uh, is that how it does? Oh, it's just two D eight, I guess. So. It's two. It's two D six. So two D six. Okay. Yeah, well, I rolled a five and a one. Uh, it is, but on the other hand, it is also magic, and so like you can see, like the the what color is your wildfire? Uh, it's kind of like it's it's fire. Like it looks like fire, but it's got more of a blue hue to it, kind of okay. like your eyes. That's cool. So yeah, this brownish green ghost is now like limbed in blue flame and almost looks like if it had if it had a body, it would look like it's burning. Also, um, a thing happened. A thing tell, happened. Tell me about the thing that happened. Okay, the thing that happened was that um, we just went over six fear for the session, which means that I get to use rally. It's a bard ability. That's um, why you're keeping track. Okay. That's why I'm keeping track. Yeah, at the beginning of the session, so this ability, it's a bard ability. At the beginning of the session, you place a d6 on your character sheet, which, I mean, on my desk, right? With a, with a one facing up. And when anyone in your party rolls with fear, you turn the rally die to increase its value by by one and when you would increase the value above six instead um i have to describe how i rally the party um okay hang on yep remove the die oh. grab how you rally the party and give every character who listens a 1d6 rally die that you can spend to roll it and add the result to any action roll reaction roll or damage roll anything anything um okay to use, a, to, use, to use a D&D term you guys are familiar with, uh, Thistle is now going to effectively give everyone a D6 Bardic Inspiration. <laughs> yeah. Um, 
So she's going to like kind of raise up in the air a little bit higher and her eyes are going to glow. They're already that kind of bioluminescent blue, right? But they're going to get just a little bit lighter and she starts speaking. And it's weirdly like everybody can hear it, even if they're in the middle of combat, they can hear her voice kind of cutting through everything. And she says, um, bound in the circle, our victory is found, the ritual above and assault on the ground. As the white fire arcanist lights up the night, bring out your arms and fight, fight, fight! And yeah, everybody gets a 1d6. Okay, everybody please note that you have a 1d6 rally die that you can add to rolls in the future. And I'm going to go ahead and say you can roll it after you see the result, just because I feel like that will let you spend it at the best time. Also, um, because I recited some words, I want to use that as inspirational words. Can I do that and mark a stress? Yeah? Uh, yeah. Okay, right. so I want to mark a stress and clear a stress from Ao. Okay, sounds good. Uh, Ao, you uh, you clear a stress. And after hearing your inspirational words, just very, very, very small. Okay. Uh, meanwhile, though, up in the air, Orphan, you are flying with this ghost. Okay. Um, and it's weird to have a grasp on an incorporeal being, especially since you can feel it starting to wiggle in your hand. And you can almost feel it starting to move up your arm, I guess I would say. Um, does a 21 pass your evasion? <laughs> if it's above a six, yes. Right. Oh, I, I have to ask. Um, You're like okay. just a big, like, weighty piece of steak that anybody yeah, can I'm, feed I'm, on. I'm made well, of gold and silver and platinum and weird metal, and I'm seven and a half feet tall, and I'm glowing. Yeah, he can hit me. Well, you're all about to feel exactly how uh, exactly how weighted they are because someone uh, this this ghost moves faster and faster, and I spend I'm spending too fear to have it pass through you um, in what is probably definitely a weird uh, sensation for you. The forest wraith essentially pushes you out of your body. And I'm going to use well. if there's any kind of resistance to this. Is there anything I can do to stop it? Uh, if it stops the attack altogether, yes, but there's no damage. It's just spend two fear and make an attack roll against a target in melee. On a success, the forest wraith passes through the target, pushing their soul from their body momentarily. They cannot act okay. again until the ritual countdown ticks down. Okay. I don't even know if I have a soul, but okay. Um, You're about to discover that you do. <laughs> okay. Uh, I have the thing called I Will Not Break, which is like the end of the gods made me and I will not allow anything to stop me, but I don't there doesn't seem to be any save or anything against this. It just he does it, right? Yep. The uh, yeah, making the attack roll was the only trigger for this. That and me actually having two fear for once. Um, full disclosure: I took away two of the tokens on the action tracker to give myself a second fear. I says I can use this. Uh, I can use them at any time to use their value in reducing coming damage, adding to a roll result, or exchanging for that many hope you may give to any other player. So uh, yeah, there doesn't seem to be anything I can do here. Okay, so you are temporarily... Uh, so you see the whole, the weird metal winged body thing just kind of go... <laughs> and, like, the wings spread out as far as they'll go, but the light stops. Yeah, I think it, I think it hovers in air because it's kind of an automatic function at this point. Like, your body is running on autopilot, and whatever passes for your soul is behind your body. <laughs> yeah. So you see that happen. All right, so... Uh... If y'all can uh, knock an adversary down, it will take that countdown thing and get the orphan back in. Uh, who is next? I like that. looking through my character sheet. Do I have anything that can knock down a ghost? <laughs> uh, so I will say that they're that they are both uh, fairly wounded, and even though you're only doing half damage with physical weapons, it would not take much for you to take out the vulnerable. It currently has. If you can do ten damage, you can kill it. <laughs> And it's also okay. still vulnerable, so you're also still at advantage to hit it. Get it. And you have a rally die. And it is now swooping. Now that it's wriggled its way free of the orphan by punching his soul out of his body, it is now swooping back down towards... Um, it's actually trying to pass you all and head for the Arcanist. Mm. Okay. No! Um, she's, still, she's still in the fog, though, isn't she's she? Still in the, she's still in the fog. It knows she's in there somewhere, but it ah. can't, so, it, so it can't like drain her life. But it's gonna, it's looking for her because she is full of delicious arcane magic, right? Delicious arcane magic and souls. Uh, the one that I was tangling with, if, is there any equivalent to like an attack of opportunity? Uh, since I don't have any fear or actions to activate it, no. 
Okay. Full disclosure, it is on you guys right now because I am flat out of resources. Oh. All right. I'm just going to, after headbutting the the wispy face of one wraith, just want to turn around and take a strike at the other one as it's flying over to go attack the Arcanist. All right. Yeah, it's it's vulnerable because the remnants of the orphan's energy are still like fluttering around its body. It's showing you where to hit. So go ahead and give me that attack roll with advantage. Can you also use the die from the re- the, the inspiration yes. thing? Yep. Um, yeah. Yes, he can also use the rally die if he needs to. Um, like I said, I'll let you roll it after you see the result, just because I want you guys to use it when it's most impactful. Okay. Um, I'm definitely going to need it because it was a 10 originally. And... Uh, yeah, you need a little more. Yeah. And so now it's going to be well with hope. Did you use your your rally die? Yeah, I rolled up. Okay. Did you add the extra d six because it's at because it's vulnerable? Oh no, I didn't. Okay. Yeah, this roll this roll rolled one d six. Well, yeah, yeah. So this roll is essentially two d twelve plus two d six. You're gonna hit it because you can't roll less than a one. That's what it yeah. has to. This next one was a six, so I definitely smacked it. Yay! <laughs> you got it. Uh, yeah, you like. You just get up out of the pile of the, you know, maybe you like shake off some of the skeleton. You shake off the memory of the panic, and you're like, not this time. And you launch this, this right. And then, um, okay, one of the other ones that I have, or one of the other class features I have, is unstoppable. Basically, uh, equal to, uh, I have four chances to do anything once per long rest, and one of those is gain resistance to physical damage or add an additional d6 to any damage rolls. Can I use one of those? Oh wow, yes. Lot- on this damage roll as well, you absolutely can. So roll your roll, roll your two. roll your damage. Give me the unstoppable and okay. Let's so get it. Base damage is going to be a six, and then plus the d six, it's going to be three. So nine in totals. Uh, yeah. So you yeah, your sword connects this time, and you you don't know what's different this time. Maybe it's the the remnant magic from the orphan, but this this wraith. Your swords swing through it, and then they catch, and then there's this horrible shriek, and it just dissipates like smoke into the night, and you take out one of the wraiths. Uh, Orphan, you managed to get your senses back together, and you are back in your body now. How far away am I if I go straight up to my full movement? Um, you can, I mean, if you're just going to get move, far. Like, oh, yeah, if you're just going to move far, you can, you can just do that. I go up as far as I can, and then I turn back and aim the hand at the one on the ground and say, I didn't enjoy that. <laughs> and I'm going to fire a bolt at oh, it. Okay, yeah. So you don't have to go out to do it. With Within far encompasses melee. Oh, well, I still do it anyway. Far. Yeah, yeah. I mean, if you just want to do it from the skies, yes, please, by all means, blast it. Uh, give me that spell cast roll. And I have her rally? Yes. Yeah. Um, yes, you can use the rally. Two eights. Two eights <laughs> is a crit. So what roll... Is- I never roll yeah. with this. So uh, go ahead and roll me 2d8 and then add 16 to it. And then uh, tell me what it looks like when you explode a forest rate. <laughs> That's only eight, but it's eight plus 16. So 24, I yeah, guess. It's sev- it's severe damage modifier is 20 and, or so damage threshold is 20. And that takes out the rest of its hit points. Okay. When I do it, like I'm, I'm clearly not as composed as I normally am. Punch and in fact, the <laughs> my color, the color of this beam is tinged with red. Like it's still mostly Ooh, blue, uh, but the thing in the inside is kind of red. And I'm like, you know, I say that whole thing, like I did not enjoy that. <laughs> and the beam comes down and just kind of, it, it's like I'm orbital striking it sort of, it just hits it. And just it's, you can tell I'm really angry. Uh, and, and then I kind of nice. come down and I, I sort of like, I, I'm not flying right. I come down and kind of like hit the ground and I'm still okay ish, but I'm like clearly don't look normal. Like my eyes, which are normally amethysts are kind of almost more like corundium. They're almost reddish now. Yeah. There's so this blast uh, that dissipates this ghost, like sears a sigil that none of you have actually seen before into the ground. Like the grass is scorched in the symbol that the orphan lands. And as, as it lands, uh, so does the carriage with a sudden control <laughs> lands on the ground. And as you look over, uh, well, you still see fog. <laughs> wave oh, a hand fog clear the, I wave a hand and clear the fog. <laughs> yeah, um, you see the uh, the arcanist who has 
pulled one of the sides of the, the carriage back up so she has something to sit on and the keystone uh, kind of hovering in place above where it was and just, just gently humming. Like you can feel, you know how when you hear a very deep sound and you feel it more in your chest than you hear it? Like you can feel the energy radiating off of this stone. And the Arcanist just kind of sighs with relief and says, very good, you fought hard. I'm not surprised, of course, the circle bound keep good company, but very glad you were there. And the ritual was a success. Oh, good. We wouldn't want any party crowd. No, of course not. And she'll, she'll, you know, undo the magic that then fold the, she folds the, she folds the carriage back up. So it's a carriage again. Um, and we'll kind of step outside and leans against it. She says, so it'll take a day or so for the magic to fully settle. Uh, but, uh, I know that you've, that it'll be about the time you get back. It'll be ready to go back in place. Um, just watch it to make sure nothing cracks or becomes sentient or anything like that. You know how it is. Sentient? You, you know, you know how it is. And uh, in the meantime, uh, if no, you... No, I don't know how it is. Ah, <laughs> uh, you'll learn. <laughs> she says, I saw, the fire. I saw your fires, child. You, you know magic. You'll, you'll, you'll learn a lot of weird things before you pass from this world. She says, so uh, if, if you'll uh, intend to stay in the clover, please, uh, your, your tab is on me this evening. You've done fine work. Do, you, do we owe you anything for charging it? Her eyes kind of light up, and she says, "Well, since you asked, and if we were, if this, if this was a TV show, you would see the camera kind of pull out, and you would see that dotted throughout the sable wood are these gigantic stone spires. They're kind of like twisting, and they're made of stone, but they each have a flame at the top, like a beacon or like a lighthouse above the top of the woods. Mm -hmm. And the arcanist says, "There's a spire west of here. Um, I felt it on the way to the ritual, um, and I wonder if it might not have something going on with what's." happening in the woods because it feels weaker than usual its power feels strange and i'm worried something is wrong with the spire keeper if you've got time i would greatly appreciate it after you've rested of course you've all had a big night and before you head back if you could just check on the spire keeper and make sure that they're okay and make sure the fire on the spire is not in danger and when you're ready uh i'll give you my map to head there uh, and she kind of smiles as she says it's been a while since we've had actual heroes in the sable world and that is you're that we're nice we're heroes and that is where we we're going to end for today <laughs> that was fun the orphan is now a slightly traumatized robot no, poor orphan I, I was like i was like he should just punch the wraith inside out <laughs> Do the same yeah, thing the, the, right? orphan, the orphan just learned it as a soul. Yes, it's very oh, that's, that's very confusing. Yeah. Like, wait, I have a soul that I'm a living thing. Yeah, your clank friend is having an existential crisis. So I like actually, this... as I come down, like I, one of the first things I do is grab Ia by the shoulder. I have a soul. I, I have a soul, and they can take it out of my body. I saw. I know. I saw. <laughs> what I does that mean? Sh- it. You're alive. I shouldn't <laughs> be. Should I? Is that what we yeah. do? I just I don't know. I, with the look of pure panic and like just confusion as much as he is like Yes, I don't know. <laughs> yeah. I guess we so have some questions just, to yeah. answer. That's actually happening in the end credits as the credits are going up and everybody's <laughs> like talking about the next step. There's like a very confused and upset robot confusing and upsetting a human in the back of the cart. Yeah, like your conversation elf. is just happening as the cart rolls and back in. Yeah, the he's woods. an elf, not a human. Yeah, no, yes, no. So I'm very sorry. No boring it's humans okay. at this party. <laughs> All kind of look human to me. I'm sorry. Yeah, <laughs> very very Slight ear variation, but for consistency. I mean, I thought she was a green human. I thought that that was a small winged human, and then you were just a human. So I, I'm sorry. I, I don't know what what people are called. Well, but also like even though elves are tall, the the orphan is much much taller. So the fact that the giant robot picking up a still tall per- humanoid and shaking it. I'm not I'm lifting you up. I just have my hand on your shoulder going, right, what oh, is okay. happening? <laughs> all right. But with that, that is, uh, that is that is it. That's all we got for today. What'd you guys think? I think it's got potential. I think you're right oh, about some fun. of the dice roll stuff. It's uh, the, the lack of initiative feels kind of weird. Like somewhere in there, I lost track. Oh, have I done something this round? Have I not? Yeah. Done, should I do something now? I'm not sure. Uh I just so I made was... a decision, like in the middle of that fight, that I would always go last because hmm. I felt like since I'm protecting people, that's my goal. I'm gonna wait and see what's going on, and then I'll act. Like I'll see what they do, and then I'll make a decision. But and I like I was... that it's kind of up to us what we do. 
Yeah, I was kind of holding back at the end there because I... I knew I was like one away from the rally, right? Mm. So I was like <laughs> waiting for that fear to hit, but it didn't hit, didn't hit, didn't hit. And finally I was like, okay, fine. I'll just roll something. And then I got the fear. I was like, okay, cool. I got to use it. Cause I, I, I just wanted to use it once just to see what happened. <laughs> yeah. And I will say full disclosure, that's actually part of the reason I did specifically name Arvid and Ao at, at one point during that fight is because I knew the two of you hadn't done anything in a while. And I was like, mm -hmm. well, it's, it's trying to pass the spotlight back to you guys. Um, yeah. It like you, you kind of need to, there isn't an official way to keep track of it. There's not an official initiative, but you still kind of have to keep track of it because everyone, mm -hmm. I think everyone still gets kind of an attack per round just in whatever order feels right. Yep. That's uh and that is, uh, that is, that is partly as part of the DMing role on this is to move the spotlight around. It's a, uh, it's a fairly common feature of narrative focused games. And I can see where mm -hmm. maybe for less experienced DMs, mm -hmm. it would be a little off putting, honestly. Um, and I feel like with the action tracker right there, it would be very easy to just set it up so it's like, okay, everyone has to take an action before someone yeah. else can take another one. But, um, and it kind of goes back and forth. I know they've had earlier iterations of these rules where I think that was there. There was also one where the, it wasn't like based on how many activations you guys have, actions you guys have done, like the, the DM activated whenever you rolled with fear, which I can see mm -hmm. that either getting very, very bad very quickly or honestly like not having a whole lot to do. <laughs> Okay, Joe is typing something, so I'm assuming he's going to be like, you know, he's yeah. saying it's 100. percent It's a weird gray area between 100 percent narrative game and D and D. He's absolutely correct. This is like the weird love child of like D and D and Blades of the Dark. It does feel I really. That's that's the one it feels like Blades in the Dark. Yeah. I was trying to remember. I really like the whole hope fear system, though. It's kind of fun and fluid. I do too. I did not expect to get choked on fear resources because you guys are consistently mm. rolling hopes or crits. But I mean, if you think about it. That makes sense. The things you're doing that have a chance to go bad don't. <laughs> so yeah. no, from I'm a general sure. sense, it makes sense. But on the other hand, I was like, I really want to use this ability to punch someone's soul out of their body. Yeah, and then I got and, to. And, and then I yeah, because I remembered that I can do a two for one thing of swapping fear for activations or activations for fear. Yeah, no, we are exactly. still recording, by the way. Yes, I know. I, I kind of wanted to have this just maybe oh, okay. get our no, feelings no, on at the end. Absolutely. Uh, yeah, I think I I enjoyed it. Um, I I do feel like my dice were pranking me a bit because I I <laughs> never <laughs> roll like when I rolled the two ones I thought ah that's my usual rolling luck terrible and then you're like yeah that's a crit I'm like I was even like oh man I can't believe I rolled two ones and you were like no that's a crit mm -hmm. I'm like wait what that's yeah. two ones man <laughs> I can actually I can actually hear the despair in your voice but yeah, yeah. I I mapped this out because I I actually have I have an Excel spreadsheet the role um, mm -hmm. like chart in it. And this game is rather than being a bell curve, like a D20 role tends to be, this is like a bell curve, but player weighted. <laughs> like mm. the, the curve is off to one side. Um, it is much more likely that you guys will either get hope or a crit, than you will fail or roll a few. Um, and I mean, and I mean, that's, that's also yeah. just the luck. Like you guys can, cause there, cause there are technically 12 more results they give you a hope and there are a fear results. So. Yeah. yeah. Cause two ones, two twos, two threes, whatever, any up to two twelves, that's a crit. You get a hope and things go well. So exactly. yeah, it is interesting. It's uh, fun. I think there's a lot of refinement. And I mean, as we know, yeah. this, this is a beta. There's a lot of things that will probably change between now and then, but overall I, I was really looking forward to this and I had a lot of fun. I hope you guys did. Same. Yeah. 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 I, totally. If we, if we get to do another one at some point, that'd be pretty cool. I agree. I think even if we don't do any more podcasts on this, I would definitely probably just keep playing this game, if only because I really like these characters you guys have made. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, I I don't know that we want to do more podcasts of it right now, but yeah, I'd definitely be down to play more just for funsies. Yep. Maybe we'll let, uh, maybe if they put out a new version of the rules or we'll visit it then. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we could. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. would be down for that. Blizzard Watch is made possible due to the generous contributions at patreon.com slash Blizzard Watch. Your continued support means that this podcast site and community is able to thrive and grow. Blizzard Watch supporters enjoy exclusive benefits like early access to the podcast, a better chance at having your question answered on our podcast or the queue, and an ads-free site experience. 